welcome from strangers. And I don't mean the team. I mean the, the villagers, the people in the mountains, everybody we bumped into. It was absolutely was refreshing. So cool. yeah. Just yeah. refreshing. Dude, it was so nice. I felt more welcome there than I do at the States, you know. Like, you do. Yeah, was... As soon as we got home, the minute we got in the airport, we got yelled at for not moving quick enough in line, right? And I'm laughing yeah. because the line ain't going any goddamn way. All we're going to do is move three feet forward. It, it, you're not missing anything. We're in a, we're in the line to get through customs and, and, and border clearance, right? So it isn't like you're going to rush into the store and go shopping. You're not no, going to And the minute we got the in there, we started getting scared. scolded. Oh, awesome. <laughs> Very awesome. Yeah. Sorry for that, guys. I, I I went to I went to the surgery and my browser literally crashed like immediately. Mm -hmm. um, I, whatever the issue was, uh, it seems to be resolved now because now everything's running smoother than before. Um, but I did go ahead and start the stream. Um, and since like we we hit that time, um, I I and it didn't exactly launch the way that I thought it was going to, but that's cool. Um, yo, <laughs> welcome every guys. Uh, your boy Alchemist Ganjie here. Um, welcome to another episode of the Canical. You know, I'm with my uh, uh, my guest co-hosts, so Ryan and Kelly. And today, um, we are going to be um, we're going to be interviewing a a, a, a industry legend. Um, a, it's a somebody who has touched the cannabis industry in such a way that, like, if if you toke, like, it, chances are, like, your your flower, your the quality of your flower is better because of work that like uh, this individual did. Um, as well as people just like, and we're talking about Kevin Jodry. Uh, welcome to the podcast. Uh, how are you doing today? Awesome. Thank you for having me on. It's uh, it's it's pretty. I love I love doing casts with friends, and so I know all three of you well. So it's it's really kind of like hanging out with your friends online. So thank you for the invite. Yes, yes, and my 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 thoughts exactly because you know that we're we're all we're all here having here to sesh. There are a lot of people that that are tuning in to watch today that like uh, that 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 they've watched your content from afar. That just like really appreciate your work, um, and uh, and I mean like like just like we followed your your journey through Pakistan, like a GW Smoke Break TV, like like he he covered like uh, like your guys' content so well. I really like just felt like I was there. Like if you guys don't follow him on Instagram, GW Smoke Break TV, like you you will get true exposure to like just the world of cannabis culture. A big inspiration to me. Um we we also watched your um like your podcast uh, that you did with uh, the Future Cannabis Project, um, oh. where you actually like we really got into like just the full overlay of their entire um, expedition um, to Pakistan. I mean, I, I I can't think of a better word for it other than expedition, and that like uh, if you haven't had a chance to watch it, um, I mean, just to get you a nice fat doobie and just go check it out. Future Cannabis Project, like they like just really, really amazing. Um, like today, what we're going to be talking about is like some of the, some of the more, the, the nuanced knit and grit of cannabis culture. Um, what really first like, like piqued my own interest is when you were talking about, um, like just your time leading up to going, um, to Pakistan and how that there were some like cultural differences and misunderstandings and that like you really wanted to like learn more about this culture here. Um, so I was thinking like, Hey, you know, we, we could all benefit from from learning uh, uh, some culture. Um, like, what, what was your what was your first um, like they take on this whole experience when you got there? I know when you landed, like you pretty much got flour like put right in your lap in the airport. <laughs> yeah, I know. It was pretty trippy. We actually went to Dubai first, which was kind of neat because. Oh. It, yeah, because Dubai, it was funny we, when we get to Dubai they had us lay over there for about eight, nine hours. So we could just see what Dubai was since we landed there. And then we, we jumped on the plane and went to Pakistan and we meet this cat. I think his name was like Faisal. He was the driver that was brought in to drive us around Dubai, to, you know, let us see it. And it was funny because I'm looking at it and he goes to me, he looks at me, he goes, Dubai is artificial. Pakistan is organic. And it was just this really, it set the tone for the trip because Dubai is like as technologically supersonic as it gets where, you know, they're, they're creating the world's highest buildings, biggest structures, most incredible things you've ever seen. And, and it was unbelievably clean and safe and sterile, but 
it 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 didn't have like a, a an organic life whereas pakistan was this place that was just something out of i mean out of your imagination you you know you're you're in a region that we don't have really any information about that isn't kind of skewed so for me i mean i've been desiring to go to these regions since i was a little kid and for you know most of my life you're like whoa too and then you know all the years of the afghani conflict with the russians and then with the with the 911 shit it just creates a situation where you think you're never going to get to go see it and so when and then you you have all these perceptions that are crafted about you know radical islam and a lack of friendliness and a hatred for travelers and a distaste for americans and it was just this one thing after another. And I mean, I'm, the number of people that hit me up and told me they were going to cut off my head and, and kidnap me and sell me for money. And I wasn't valuable enough so that therefore the government wouldn't bail me out. I mean, it was the craziest shit ever, right? And I was just like, wow, that's our reality. And so when you get there and you, you, you at first you're like, you know, what's going on? What you find is that strangers are treated really well and so people that don't belong there are treated automatically well because it's a cultural necessity and once we were in the mountains we understood how that was all formed we realized that there is a necessity to get along and that because you know even like an herb if you look at herb our problem for so much of the culture is that we were all able to be so autonomous and independent for so long we forgot how to work together and when it mm -hmm. came time to really deal with difficult tasks, we didn't know how to like take a subordinate role or a leadership role because we only knew the role we played in our own lives. And it didn't allow us to team up and work together. And what I saw there was just an acceptance of the fact that because there's less, they have to actually work more towards the goal. And so it just kind of, it's not that there's a better or worse, it's nothing against America or American people because I'm American and, and I think America has some of the most beautiful people in the world too. My friends are, I, I couldn't ask for better friends than I have. Like if I could go right down a list of what I wanted in a friend, I have those people in my life. So it, it's not a comparison contrast. It was just such a revelation that we've done such a disservice to that region with the way we've painted it. And once you get there and you start to experience it, you start to realize that it's like woven across. And I wasn't in a neighborhood. I wasn't in one area. I mean, we went through and covered this entire Silk Route range. So I saw village after village after village after village after village after place after it. And, and I was hiking in the mountains in the morning with the other Pakistani crew. And we would go hike around and we would go pop into people's farms and pop up into their orchards. And they would come out and tell us which was the best fruit tree to eat from. And if you want a bag of walnuts, we got a bag for you to take down and you can have them later. And, and I mean, it was just unbelievably hospitable and, and friendly. And so what it did is it just made you feel really comfortable. And because of it allowed you to like really open up your mind and see the region. So anytime you're working in a place that's dangerous, your mind is on the danger and the project. Mm -hmm. But when you're not feeling the danger, your mind is only on the project. And in this case, it was to really experience Pakistan in its glory. And glory meaning that Pakistan is really the rooftop of the world. So you got 7,000 glaciers. The, the, that whole region out of Nepal through the Himalayas down into Pakistan, that's the headwaters of the Indus River. The Indus River waters one-third the Earth's population. When we use the word Indica, Indica's India, India's in this river. Mm. So like when you see the roots that built the world and you travel the, the Silk Route and you realize, once I started kind of digging into it, I realized that um, first that we all have different history lessons, right? So like what we were taught in school isn't necessarily what others were taught in school. And so it's kind of weird because when you quote what you've been taught, people like, hey, that's go back to school and learn. And I'm like, that was the school I went to. And <laughs> you, you, you for real, right? Yeah. So it's weird. Like when you when you start living history, it becomes pretty, pretty uh, contentious if you're not trying to understand that just because you saw it written in a book doesn't mean it's real. And so what happens is we start to take a look and we realize that from archaeological research, they believe that the Neanderthal, which populated Europe, 
merged with the human which left Africa and is in these Asiatic regions. And it was the silk route that they touched on. And they weren't there to trade silk, obviously, because it's prehistoric. It's that they were trying to escape climate change. So even back then, climate change was, a, was an issue. And they would move south or north, east or west, to deal with drought or frost, right? So if you had heavy, you know, cold seasons coming in, it was too savage, everybody's freezing to death, they move. It's too hot, no water, everybody moves. And so this route was formed because once you're there, you 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 can't really understand how anybody figured out the route because you're in you're in, you know, a mountain range, the three biggest mountain ranges in the world colliding. So you got the Kurukuram the Himalayas and the Hindu Kush all colliding together. And each one's basically on its own continental plate. So you have these three continental plates colliding and the Himalayas are relatively new. So they're only, you know, 30 to 50 million years old. And because of it, they're extremely jagged and rough. And you can see where the upheavals occurred because you can see the rock patterning. And it's wow. so huge and it's so big that when you look at it, you're like, how did any human being figure this shit out? And that's really when I started to look at it, I realized, whoa, it was figured out in the prehistoric area, prehistoric era. And as these people are just naturally being forced to move, they find the pathways, they create the trails, it creates the memory. As time goes on and, and nations are, are being built and cultures are being built, the Silk Route turns into the the trade between China and Rome. And it created every single industry in that chain because everybody wanted to be part of the Silk Route. And and I'm doing the research on it and I find that that's where the word middleman comes from. Middleman right, is right. a word directly from the Silk Route because nobody went end to end. They only stopped at a spot and you passed it to somebody in the middle. So the middle person took it to the next spot. And so there was someone who created the flow and then someone who moved the flow. And so it's funny, but all these phrases and words we use in our lives, you, you, you're you always trying to understand the entomology of it, where it came from. And it was just fascinating to understand how the Silk Route had created this massive industrial revolution, so to speak, because each country that the Silk Route passed through, they also wanted to get engaged and sell goods. And so they huh. didn't have silk but they had other fabrics, they had uh, other things to sell. So it fostered this development and then the money keeps moving one way, the goods keep flowing another. Pretty soon the people in Asia wanted goods from the Europeans. And so now not just money is flowing, but goods, technology. So it was this unbelievable thing to travel because you're, you're, I was walking on it. I mean, I'm walking on the frigging road. Like I'm on the actual Silk Road. The Kurukuram is like Silk Road 2.0. They built this road in, in like in the 60s. The Chinese and the Pakistanis built it. And it, re, it, it allows you to have some form of travel that's not on a goat trail. But we were walking on the cobbled goat trail. And I was just like, whoa, the blocks under my feet were a couple thousand years old. And all I could think of was the the amount of goods and materials that had moved on that road how much and the impact of it and what it had done and it just it's just heavy because like when you're in the u.s we have a relatively young history and so you know we we as europeans at least we came over in you know the say 1500s and we colonized my family got here in the 1600s and we've been here ever since. So, you know, 350, almost 380 years of living in New England and living in the same house for like 300 of those. So in my mind, you know, I'm like, I can understand that much history. And then I look at the native populations that were here and I'm like, well, they were here for thousands of years. But the history got removed with the purge when we went and exterminated the populations. We really stole that history. And when you get over to, to parts of Asia, their their history still exists in a sense because it's still you know 1200 year old temples there's yeah. trading posts that are 1500 years old there's carved rocks from when you know when when buddhism first kicked in and they're from like the ninth century and you're looking at you know 30 40 foot carved rocks that are a giant boulder that's been completely carved to show the life cycle of buddha and the ascension and you're looking at this and you go let me get this this is 1300 years old and this was these you know these 
culturally significant spots to these individuals, but they're still there so you can see it. And so it's to see that and to, to feel the rock and to see the trail. And so it hasn't been completely wiped out, you know, so there's still the traces of the past. And when you, when you're there, you, you just really feel, and it's funny, but I love the feeling of feeling insignificant. There's, there's a, there's a joy to it that you're nobody and you're, you're just there. And to be, to be on the road and to be in the region and to see the size of the mountain ranges and to understand the difficulty of having to exist at that altitude and, the incredible, incredible effort required to make it happen. It was just like, I don't know, man, it was profound. I lost the ability to speak a couple of times where wow. if someone had asked me to describe something, I, I couldn't, I was like speechless. Wow, that I'd sounds, that sounds so much like, I like hearing you talk about this and what, like, a, like it, it, it honestly reminds me of when, when I, I came out to Humboldt um, and yeah, like, Humboldt like, just like, your breath. Like just seeing like just like the vastness of because I mean I'm in the Blue Ridge and the Blue Ridge has amazing diversity it has lots of stuff going on it's a very old mountain range but it's also kind of short and then like going to Humboldt like just like the everything was bigger everything was taller and I'm like having these same experiences of like being like kind of awestruck I'm like how I'm like going down these roads these dirt roads off of a cliff thinking about how many like hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and thousands of like pounds of weed as like you know like traveling up and down like on these things and like i had this feeling when i was there like of like wow this is like like to me like cannabis mecca um but then hearing you talk about pakistan it's like wait a minute like <laughs> is this really like the true like uh, like like mecca because um some something that i i, I either had forgotten or just wasn't aware of that like our our cannabis culture in large part was was fueled and funded like by pakistani genetics oh totally well you know at, you gotta remember it was all hindustan until 1947 so pakistan the nation pakistan is is relatively a new country and so this whole region and and the region was was tumultuous because you had alexander the great coming over and you had genghis khan coming down and you had the people of Hindustan that were there. So you have these massive cultures all merging and colliding along the Silk Route. And what you see is it was is all these things that, you know, we have in the U.S. like stone fruit. Well, stone fruit aren't indigenous to the U.S. They, they come out of they come out of these places. And so you start to like realize like, whoa, the people from Greece carried this over as food. And when they were done eating it, they threw a seed down and bam, that's where that shit came from 4000 years ago. And so you start to like see this, this understanding of movement of plant material and culture. And you, you, you realize that like when we, when we start talking about age of cannabis in those areas, which would be like, you know, what we would call now India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, we can say it's like 6,000 years through ethnobotanical research and documentation. But every village I went to, they were in the 1500 to like 1700 year memory where each village I went to, when I got to talk to some of the elders or talk to the hash maker or, or, or just talk to people, everyone knew their history. That was what was trippy. You can't you go to the mm. U.S. and ask somebody, tell me what happened here. And they're like, they have no clue. <sighs> yeah, not a, not a chance. And, and no, because we're not, we're not, we don't have the same connection to our country, which is odd because we have a beautiful country too. So we just don't seem to have the same like knowledge of it good or bad. It's not about being pro or con. It's just understanding how we got to where we are. And so for them, every village I went to, I asked them, I'm like, how long have you guys been working with this? And they were like, mm -hmm. herb was here when we got here 1500 years ago. And so what you have is you have places that are like in, in India, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Mongolia, China, Indochina, those places are the only places that can really be called like appellations of cannabis because cannabis has been there so long that the cannabis and the place created what you're, what they, the populations had to work with. So you start to really understand this relationship between region and flower right. and, and how the plant developed in that soil. So what I did is I took soil. I got a collection of every patch, every of the eight collection sites I went to, I gathered soil at all of them. Yeah, have you had any of that uh, been tested yet, or is it like? I no, mean, no, that'll happen next. Uh, yeah, no, that'll that'll come next. 
And so I've only been home two weeks. And so I'm trying <laughs> to get my, trying to get my life together here. I want to dig into that a little bit, Kev, where, where all those regions and those different cultures kind of come together. I noticed a big difference when I was in India versus what you were seeing in Pakistan as far as the, the hash culture in general, how it's processed, how the plants are harvested, how they're used, and like and even the people making the selections in the populations. You, <clears throat> excuse me. You were saying that uh, the Pakistanis were kind of driving it by selecting through males. Yeah. And then I noticed in India, it's just straight up open pollination. They don't really get in there and, and cut out any disease. They don't cut out males or females or anything. They just let the fields grow. That, that yeah, was the interesting. Pakistanis do. But the thing is, you know what, you know what their reason is though, is that what, mm. what, what tripped me out more than anything was why did people play with the plant to begin with? Because yeah. they wanted the fucking seed. They, yeah. It was a food source. Cannabis was food. And then they then they learned from the food that if you ate the plant, you felt better. So, I mean, I'm asking them. I said, what was the evolution here? Like, you're asking old men who can say, for a thousand years, we lived right there. Yeah. Like, you, you can, they can track their life back for a millennia. We lived right there. And then, uh, but 500 years before that, we lived on the other valley. But then we moved. And then we're here. And you're just like, it's crazy. But it was food. And then they, they, and they, it was, it was the same analogy as coffee because coffee is an Arabic discovery, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the shepherds see the, 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 the goat eat the bean, the goat gets excited. They try to figure out what's this thing. They don't understand. They have to roast the bean, but once they figure out they have to roast the bean and then just, you know, then extract the caffeine from it. Now you have the single most uh, widely sold drug on planet earth. Yeah. So what, what the, you, you mentioned the food part, like the seeds that there was, um, like you mentioned, like some type of like dish that was even prepared using cannabis seeds like that they eat. Yeah, they mix the it with wheat seed, wheat seed. It's really wheat only seeds. served in the winter. Yeah, they only eat in the winter. They don't need to have it in the other parts of the year because they have such fertile soil and everything's so beautiful. But the four months of winter in the Himalayas. It is so cold and sad. Like, that's what I that's what I learned is that everybody was getting ready to hunker down for a savage, brutal winter. And I realized that that was just the way it is. All the doors are half height. Oop. Oh man. Oh, look! It looks like it looks like we might have lost you for a second there, uh, Kev. Um, it says says we got a full signal. Uh oh. I mean, I just for the meantime, I, we saw the same thing in Himachal Pradesh. You know, a lot of the houses were two stories. What he was saying is the doors are, you got to duck, you got to crawl through the doorways. And it's a way to trap heat inside the homes in the wintertime because they just have a tiny little stove in the middle of the home and it's two stories and there's a stove on each story. But, you know, they can only burn so much wood because it's not like a heavily, heavily lumbered area. They, they, it's too much work to do a lot of heavy logging. So it's like all the brush that breaks down, it's all the limbs that can be snapped off trees and it's anything dead that's already hit the ground that's small enough for them to carry. Um, and then they keep a lot of the livestock underneath the house to, to keep them warm in the wintertime. So it's, it's like this mutualistic living that it, because it's so fucking harsh, there's three, four foot of snow, at least in Himachal Pradesh, uh, through those valleys all winter long. So that there's nothing to do. And so like he was saying, they were, they, they just harvest everything that they can. They're preparing all the livestock feed. They go through the, the Himachali people just go through up and down the mountainside and they're harvesting all the wild grass. They're harvesting all the vegetation that, that is edible and they're drying it in their homes outside on the porches and stuff so that it's, it's available through the, throughout the wintertime to feed the livestock. And they use the cannabis seeds in India for, for feeding the livestock. Um, there weren't any dishes that I saw. It was more like a, a snack or trail mix, like sunflower seeds or peanuts, something like that, that they would have hemp seeds in it. But other than that, it was just, it was livestock feed and then, and then to broadcast next season out in the field so that they could grow more for, for charis. Yeah. And, uh, How did yeah, you feel after eating hemp seeds? I guess. <laughs> I didn't eat a whole lot there. There okay. wasn't too many available. So it was just, I, I was kind of blown away by that. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> it wasn't more incorporated into their life. You know, they just they chopped the top of the plant off where there was buds. They rubbed it in between their hands for charis, and then seeds fell out onto a tarp or a blanket. 
and they'd save the seeds, clean them up, get the get the brack shells off of them and stuff, and then clean them up and store them in barrels over wintertime. And some of the bigger farmers that had bigger fields would have three, four, about 55 gallon drums full wow. of seeds. Okay. So, huh. Now, okay. Yeah. So, um, where, where we are currently, um, at, it would seem, um, I guess his feed m- must have cut out. I don't know if he was having an internet problem or a technical problem. I just messaged him. Uh, it's humble. <laughs> what's that? It's humble. Uh, yeah, yeah. So, uh, <laughs> we shall see. Hopefully, hopefully we'll be able to get him back in pretty soon. Um, I, I am, I, I, something that I thought was, uh, something I thought was pretty interesting, I guess also while we're like, we're waiting, um, is, uh, we were talking, um, about with, uh, the difference between like the actual, like morphology of the plants between India and Pakistan. And uh, like, you were talking about how like dense, um, the plants were in Pakistan versus like how hollow and kind of weak that they were in uh, Himachal Pradesh. Um, and we we were talking about like, uh, like, you know, like the, the hollowness and what that was to be for. We're talking about water transmission and whatnot. Um, I was recently talking with a um, uh, with with a cultivator that um, I guess he's definitely one of the more knowledgeable ones. Um, you know, shot out to the turp farmer like <laughs> um, and we were talking about like uh, that, how like the like just the hollowness inside like the stem. And he said, you like, you know, a lot of people don't really like uh, uh, he like don't, don't really think about it necessarily in maybe the correct sense. And then he said that like that, that hollow tube in the middle isn't actually for, for water transmission. I was like, what the hell are you talking no. about? And no, he said like, he was like, well, if you snap it, like, I mean, like no water comes out. Like, <laughs> it's just the outer layer, the thin green bark that becomes your bast fiber. Um, once the plant is, is dried and redded um, that, that thin bark on the outside, that's your, that's your, I believe the xylem. Um, so, and that is what transports water up the plant. The phloem is down. Yeah. Um, so then, so, so then like, so then why, why would, uh, like, so, so what impact on like water transmission would like the hollowness of a, of a stalk have? Um, I don't think it's really that much. You're looking at more nutrient deficiency because what that is, the inside of the, the stem is called your pith. Yeah. And that's where you get like your hemp herd and your, for your hemp crete and insulation. It's like, it's very woody. Um, and what's happening with those hollow plants is called pith autolysis. And the plant is digesting the pith because that is a carbon and a calcium sink. So it's just, a, it's like a battery. It's like a storage for the plant for nutrition. Right, right. Okay. And it's meant to stabilize the plant. Um, and my, my hypothesis being that those soils um, in Himachal Pradesh, they're nowhere near as fertile as what Kevin was talking about in Pakistan. And it's also much more i mean i don't know i haven't seen the fields in pakistan but every field we were on was there's no flat part to the field there's very yeah. little flat land it was so all you on have that gangster land. Yes, yeah, so you've got all your water water runoff and there's not a lot of nutrient retention because the, the cannabis plants are so densely planted yeah it does prevent erosion but uh, you know it's just vertical landscape so I, I think just with the plant density, how thick they're planting the seeds, they're reaching for light because it's more like a grass at that point um, or bamboo. And so they're, they're just fighting each other for light and to get that tall. Cause some of those plants were 12, 15 foot. And so they're just, and they're all a foot apart and they're just reaching for light. So I think they're consuming <laughs> extra nutrients to get up there. Okay, I'm um, just just got a message from Kev. Um, I'm going to I'm going to refresh the link on this um, okay. because he's because he's saying it's not letting it's not letting him back in. Um, so, boom. Okay, so I sent him a new link, um, and hopefully we'll uh, hop in soon. That's yeah, yeah. Um, I, like I, I, I appreciate all of you guys. Um, here, let's switch it to this real quick. Boop. I appreciate all of you guys for um, <laughs> being on the live stream. This this live recording of this interview with with Kevin Jodry, um, and with live recordings, sometimes these types of things happen. Um, yeah, c'est la vie. Um, but uh, we uh. Uh, it looks like we should hopefully be having him back in the room pretty soon. I just sent him like a new, a new link. Um, 
and uh, I'm just like, yeah, just kind of scrolling up and down on this thing um, to to see to see where it's at now. Oh no, I don't want to talk about this the, this part yet. See, I like I got I brought I got some hash. Um, that I'm gonna ask Kevin to walk me through like doing like a traditional preparation. Uh, yes. <laughs> you know the ritual. How do they break it down? Like, yeah. Learning from all the Indian people was wicked cool. How they how they package them. Yeah. It's almost always tobacco. I think Kevin had the same experience. Yeah. Um, I'm just flour sure. becoming more of a thing now right. because. Of, yeah. It's oh, really like the... <laughs> hey, <laughs> welcome back! Welcome back! Yeah, yeah, that, that stuff like that happens. You know, you're out in Humboldt, yeah. <laughs> oh man, we lose we lose service here. It's 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 frustrating because there's not there, there, to me that like if you can if you can tell me that you can talk to a rover on the moon and drive it, you can drive a rover on Mars, and you're gonna tell me you can't get me some cell signal across the state. Right. And I, I have a hard time believing the story that you're actually driving a rover across the across the in in, 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 in known universe. Right. Yeah, that, that, that does raise some, that definitely raise, raises some questions. Definitely raises some questions. Um, so where we were where we were at last, um, we like oh, it was uh, cannabis usage. It was Ryan was talking about what he noticed was the differences in selection methodologies mm -hmm. and extraction methodologies. And what I noticed really was that herb was a food source primarily and that only in certain areas of Pakistan, like the Tira Valley, is the full focus on extraction. So we met people that were making hash everywhere, but they're making it discreetly in small batch form. And we would just say, you know, you got like a quarter acre of cannabis on your farm. So you have a farm and you got a quarter acre of herb that you are, uh, you're working with as, you know, your, your herb source and they're, they're selecting for male. And what they're selecting for is good, healthy, vigorous males that have high resin content, good odor, good structural um, shape. And so they're selecting more than anything for like survivability and diversity, but they don't want any weak plants that have bad branches. They don't want things that are prone um, to insects. They're not looking for um, things that aren't uh, very volatile. And you notice some really clear patterns where what was cool is Every place that we gathered from was it was neighboring crops were in that same field. So I wrote mm. down what was the crop that was grown as the companion crop, so that when I did the soil analysis, I'd be able to kind of look at this picture from a oh if, if herb is yeah because they they they're not new to this. They've been doing this for a long time. So all these crops are mixed crops. So what 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 type what type of interesting um uh, companion uh, crops did you see growing along uh with with uh with cannabis there? It was either, you know, apricot, walnut or potato. Hmm. And so and so the potato, the apricot and the walnut were either apricot walnut fields with rimmed in cannabis or potato hmm. rimmed in cannabis. And they would go through and hack and then they wanted the seed, but they didn't breed for seed size, right? So they didn't breed for seed size. They just bred for seed. They bred for diversity. They bred for survival. They know that you need to have all the profiles because they don't know what problem they're going to face. And the plants are producing profiles to mimic what's around them so they can be more attractive and repel shit and attract shit. So you started seeing these patterns of profiles that were similar in similar patches and then what we were looking for was just freak outliers so the the beauty of doing the hunting with the guys was the land race boys had their shit together so yeah. team land race has been doing you know the this type of selection for seven years now but for, so for seven years they've been on this silk road travel then over in chitrali and uh they've just been really looking at cannabis in, in a in a really good way so what it did is it, it let me say hey you know, what are you seeing? And so they said, hey, these things rep reflect the populations we see most. So then it let us take a look at those patterns and figure out what's the best example of the predominant patterns, because that's going to be your greatest chance of replication and breeding, right? Mm -hmm. So you, breeding outliers isn't really where you want to go. You want to get the outlier so you can try to isolate the trait. But if you're trying to make it easy on somebody, you want things that have dominant traits that are good. So that you just put it with it and those should come out at some frequency of um, value. 
And so we got to we got to take a look and see the patterns. And then we started hunting for the outliers and I started hunting the best things in the pattern groups. So I think I collected maybe, I don't know, 50 plus different collections. So we had a pickup truck full of weed. It was yeah. hysterical, Brian. I'm talking a full pickup truck because we just cut the plant down and stuck it in a trash bag, right? And then labeled it inside and out. And so we got an entire pickup truck. We're rolling through and herbs illegal. And so seed is legal, but herbs illegal. So we're riding around, you know, working this shit out in the fucking mountains, trying to every night break it down into smaller and smaller segments so we can go from, uh, you know, a truckload of cannabis into a single bag of cannabis that reflects, you know, three or four kilos of total seed. And so thank God it's so dry because every night when we got into the inns, we would break out all the weed. We'd break it all, open it all up and we would, we had tools and we would go through and we would make sure that, and, and we did it really organized. It was, re I'm telling you, working with the boys was great because the thing is cannabis is a craft, right? And so yeah. when you're, when you're doing your job, there's protocols that just seem to make sense if you do it frequently and keeping track and keep it clean and just keeping your shit together is one of them. <laughs> like that, that part kind of has to be with it. And so sometimes when you go to work with other people, you don't know what they're going to be like. And so, you know, you always assume the best. You always hope, hey, they're going to be pros. It's going to be fun. But man, I've been on a lot of jobs where it was an absolute freak show and this shit was a nightmare. And you were just like, how the hell did I get myself into this mess, man? This shit's a disaster. And so, you know, you have to know that that can be there too. But the, the, the team was really conscientious and detail orientated. So it made this process really nice. And they just said, hey, we just want you to help us. And if you see anything that you think would, be, you know, be a better process or a better method or a better idea, then we'll do it. And I said, great. What it'll do is it'll let me help you in the way I can help you. And it'll also let me get an education from you and the things that you do that make sense because you just can't fake the fact that everybody's got some skills. So everybody can teach anybody. It's just you got to be willing to really take a look at what they're trying to show you and then try to find the applicability so that you'll put yourself into a student platform versus, you know, contentious platform. And so working with them was good, man, because it was so dry that we could we could move the weed. And every night we would reopen everything up and re-break it down, re-break it down till we were getting to just the seed stock. And we would leave it out overnight in its own space or on a porch that was protected. And we were drying it and getting it to sift and clean. And by the time we got back to Lahore, we did our final sifting. And that's that picture I put up of all those bags of seed. That yeah. shit reflected a pickup truck worth of weed. <laughs> and, you know, and it's just some fun ass shit. Like it made me be, I, I felt like I was back like Humboldt in the nineties where you're, Ooh. you're, you're driving with a pickup truck full of, full, full of units. And you know, you're just going to get hammered if you get caught, but you're like, it's just what you do. And so we were, we were gathering and, and, and all the villages that they had worked with, they had good relationships with. And so it, it was this idea of, you know, how do you, use all the tools possible to bring attention so that the people in the areas have better cash flow and cannabis mm -hmm. is just a single thread. It's the tourism. It's, it's all these other things that let them make a little bit more income and it changes the quality of their life dramatically. And you can understand the poignancy when every elder, anybody I saw, I mean, I was, it was like, I was like Tom Cruise or something. The number of people that came up to me to take photos and shit was crazy. And they didn't know who I was. They just knew I was definitely not Pakistani. And yep. I'm in the, and I'm in the deepest part of Pakistan you can go. And they're like, what are you doing here? And I'm like, visiting your country. And they were like, and you're having a good time. I said, I'm having a great time. And they were like, and you're going to go home. And I said, yeah, I'm going to go tell people I had a great time. Don't worry about it. <laughs> you, 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 you people have been so good to me that there's no way I won't go home and tell this story. And, yeah. it, and, and it's, it's, it's a contentious one too, because every, every country has its human rights issues and every country has its stories. But you know, you, when you, when you're from America and you're throwing rocks at anybody about anything, it's like, wait a second, we're less than pure too. Mm -hmm. So we all have our backstory here. The main point is, can we create a future together that's equitable? And that was yeah. really the desire of the trip was that 
the idea that, and, and it was funny because they have this whole idea. They don't know the story of Doug Fur, right? They don't know that there's a gentleman named Doug in Humboldt who, who he didn't bring the first broadleaf seed in. What he specifically did is he brought the first seed in that was shared. So mm. there might've been five, 10 people in America total. At the time, you know, you got 200 million people. Out of 200 million people, there's 10 people in the United States that got access to broadleaf stock in the 70s. But, and so Doug had smoked it in 78. And there was an artist that he recently passed away, uh, Pat Ryan. He did all the original cannabis art, you know, all the Humboldt honeys, the red hair, the, the, all, all the cool, uh, all that cool cannabis art. That was all Pat yeah. Ryan. But his, his, his um, artwork of Kush with the Native American was he smoked, he smoked his first broadleaf experience was 78 in San Francisco with the Native American out of like Willow Creek. So Trinity. And so that was the first time he had smoked it. So there's this 77, 78, whatever took place, there's herb popping up in the U.S. that's broadleaf. But Doug and his, Doug's partner gets hit in 78 and, and he was growing like Colombian. And so it wasn't coming out till November and he gets hit in Halloween and he's furious. So they, they say, let's go plot a trip to Asia and go get the stock we need because we smoked it. We know that it's good, but we know it comes in earlier. And so they go and set this trip up and they gather the stock, bring it back, and then they share it with other growers in the area and it gets hybridized and moved. So there's no pure left of it, but it, it kickstarts this momentum, which transforms into a $20 billion U.S. industry. And so yeah. Doug is a, is a wonderful human being where he's an environmentalist. He's a, he's a wonderful chronicler of a region. He's a global traveler. He's like the prototype hippie to me where he, you know, he's got multiple college degrees, but he dropped out of Davis, you know, in the late sixties to go be a hillbilly in Humboldt because he said, fuck the system. Mm -hmm. So, you yeah. know, he's this really, really good dude. And I've known Doug for a while and I just didn't quite remember the detail of Doug got the seeds from Pakistan. I just knew Asia. And so right before I'm taking off on the trip, Doug and this other dude that's a really good friend of mine named Dr. Dominic Corva. Dr. Corva is the head of the Cannabis Interdisciplinary Program at HSU, or Cal Poly Humboldt now. And he's just a brilliant guy, and he's just a really good dude. So, like, when you have an academic who fully understands the reality of people's lives, and they actively work to, to make a better world around them, and they're in your field, they're unbelievably powerful because Dominic knows how to communicate to academia. He knows how to write grants. And he was the one that really put to any, any equity grant in California, Dominic wrote. So anytime you benefit from a grant that was written that you're able to participate in as a cannabis cultivator, it was because Dominic created those programs. And Man. so he was involved in writing a legacy grant. And I think they received like two and a half million dollars. And, and he was part of it. He's not the whole package, but he was definitely part of it. And it was about capturing the legacy of Humboldt County, Mendocino, basically the Emerald Triangle, Trinity. And to say, hey, here's the oral histories of these people. Here's pressings of the plant. So they have it in an arboreum form. Here's DNA analysis. Here's, here's context so that, that our culture doesn't just get wiped out and replaced with uh, new, new, new history, new revisionist history. Yep. And so I'll be in that, in that program Well, I'll come in and I'll give an oral history because I've spent, you know, I've only been in Humboldt for 32 years, but I'm, I'm without question, wo Humboldt is woven into my DNA at this point. And I mm. tried to, I tried to like put Humboldt in a position wherever where I went, I, I, in my mind, I was a goodwill ambassador for my region. Oh, no. yeah. No, you know what I um, mean? Yeah. yeah, and I, I definitely, I definitely think that 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 much has been accomplished, like so, so far. I mean, like uh, it's, it's just as far as like just all these different cultures, like all the way, and like I mean, Pakistan. As far as the people just recognize you as an American, I and I saw some of those videos with, with uh, like uh, on Judo Smoke Break, where they were just like they, they were just really excited on on just having you like just check out their hash and like look at what was you, going on. Being their lives, yeah, they were so happy because what they what they want is they wanted just like us. Yep. You know, we we were all excited about. It's funny, you know, legalization had some some ups and downs to it. But one of the parts that I I can't deny is nice is that you don't have to tell a lie to every single person you meet. 
So you're not <laughs> yeah. always running around lying through your goddamn teeth. And everybody's like, that shit's fun. I'm like, well, do that 30, 40 years and tell me yeah. if it's still fun after 30, 40 years of telling bullshit stories. It, there's a point where you just really don't want to have to pretend that you're somebody you're not. And so we want to be able to enjoy our culture too. We want to be able to have people come and visit and, and not feel the shame that, you know, Hey, you know, in your, in your own culture or your own area of the United States, you get stigmatized. You're from, you're from parts of the South where they still want to, you know, basically crucify you for this shit. Yeah. You're we're here definitely in County, you don't got to worry it about it. No one's going to rat you out. <laughs> you're totally cool. You can hang out. You don't have to worry. And I see the response and the, through the Ganjie program is what really caught me because I've been in public for so long that I kind of forgot what it felt like to come out. And it was through the Ganjie that people would like say, hey, this is the first time in my life I've ever been in a room and publicly admitted I was involved in cannabis. And it emotionally fucking grabbed them and it grabbed me. I was like, holy shit. Yeah. I forgot what it was like because it was so long ago for me. Right. But I'm like, man. And so what I realize is that's what these people want to do is they want to be able to just share and enjoy their culture with people, you know, in a healthy way. And the, the goal is always to not judge the culture against your culture. It's almost like saying anytime you get go to on a road, you're going to judge it off the Autobahn. Well, you're going to be disappointed if you're driving anywhere else. Yeah, and so am- you got to You got to make sure that you, you take yourself and take your identity away from yourself for a second so that you're just someone who's looking at it from a neutral perspective you're, you're not just a doing sponge pulling it yeah, all in just trying to absorb absorbing the into food, the culture. listen yeah. to the music listen to the story yeah. dance the dance and yes. and enjoy the experience of people letting you into their lives and they may only have a cheeseburger to share but you can have half of it and right. What we do is we bitch we didn't get a full burger, and you're like, the person who shared it with you doesn't even have a burger to eat, and he's giving you the damn burger. Just appreciate the fact that that it's it's at that level of of um, desired reciprocity. All they're yeah. seeking is camaraderie because they know that at the end of the day, the good relationships build the business, builds the money, builds the future. Let's you put your kids in school. No, so makes, how how was that like culturally like when when you guys sat down to smoke what was the ritual was it always behind closed doors or were you guys hanging out having you know having chai and and oh jesus well, it was outside. different for us ryan as soon as we got there right um they break out a, a pound and a half remember there's only like uh there's seven of us they call the internationals right so it's <laughs> me and six other dudes from around the world and, and we all know these guys in some capacity. I've known them for a couple of years, but just online as friends. And they've met all these individuals, so they know them. So they said, hey, this would be a good diverse group to bring. As soon as we hit the airport and we get out to the car, we got a military attache with us, right? This high rank and special forces dude that rolled with us the whole trip. So that anywhere yeah. we went, anything to do with governmental shit, homie would hop out and show his badge. And everybody would hug them and come over and fucking hug us. <laughs> yeah, it was let's like, go. Everybody yeah. needs a friend like that in life, right? You got a friend like that, you're doing good. Okay. So we roll yeah. with him. And as soon as we get in the car, they go, hey, we got weed. And I'm like, let me check it out. And I'm looking at it. And I'm like, this shit can't be outdoor. And they're like, no, a friend of ours has got a nice indoor run in here in Pakistan and and gave us six quarter pounds of all kinds of different shit i swear to god i was smoking like you know fucking watermelon skittles or something it was hysterical <laughs> and it was good it was really yeah. well done right like the herb was good and so we're Did cracking you smoke up any flour from pa- like pakistani genetics that they have no, any guns no flour anymore? whatsoever once people who, How was people an India who were dude? hash makers had never yeah. smoked hash and had never smoked flour in their fucking life and exactly. they had never seen a bond. So they were hitting the indoor with us and they were like, holy shit, this is good. <laughs> and so what you have is this new cannabis culture developing in Pakistan, but it's with the upper financial group of their children because they want to yeah. emulate IG Western lifestyle from LA. Yep. So the indoor is hitting there. But yep. what we had was we had 500 grams of hash and a pound and a half of weed. So when we got in the car, I said, we got any hash? And they said, yeah, we got fucking half a key. And I was just cracking up because I'm like, oh, you know, 500 grams of hash is enough to smoke. 
<laughs> and and it was different batches. And then the entire time we're traveling, we're bumping into other hash makers in every village that does hash, and they're breaking out their shit. Everybody and then I'm, I'm messing with the dude who had he just got back from Morocco. So he brought a big a big chunk of Moroccan that we had to shave, you know, because it's harder pressed. So it was this, it was this hash plethora. Yeah. But but I'll be honest, man, the people in Pakistan smoke hash mixed with tobacco 95% of the time. Right. And it's either mixed, they either, either, either take a cigarette apart and then you know create the matrix and put it back in, or they do that and they wrap it with a snake, or they do a hash donut on the top. That when you burn it, the hash just pours at the same speed of the burn. But we were, and so I smoked. Yeah, it's kind of cool to see. Chilling? Did they yeah. smoke any clay pipes, chilling? No, it wasn't a no. single clay pipe of chilling broke anywhere you go. And I'm talking about wow. hanging out with dudes who've been making hash since they were three. So they're grown That's men. Crazy. Their first memories of, are sieving hash with their dads at three. Their family's yeah. been doing this shit forever, and they're like, "Oh, this is easier because they just had the hash in a in a in a in a in a in a, in a crush between some plastic in their pocket. Then they yep. would pull it out and they would work it and get it all really really activated because yep. they do all their curing in the field. So they harvest the herb and then they let that shit actually get snowed on because ironically yeah. the snow is dry. It's like Colorado snow." And so it's so dry there that it, it's it was it was such a revelation because I never understood the concept of Shangri La, where I was too stupid to understand that there had to been water. But in my mind, I'm like, if it's not raining in the mountains, then how the hell do you have a tropical paradise? You can't have a tropical paradise if there's no water. I didn't realize it was all glacier fed, and so you, the Hunza is at like almost ten thousand feet. And you're wearing shorts and a t-shirt and you could get a sunburn in October. And it was yeah. balmy, baby. I mean, the weather was crazy and you're at 10,000 feet, but it was bone dry. I mean, bone dry. You were drinking gallons of water every day or you just dehydrated. We would oh, wow. we were bringing as much water as we were anything else with us because the amount of water like and the, the the Pakistanis that we were rolling with was so cognizant about that where like every time we got out of the rig, someone got another water bottle to drink. Like yep. maintain hydration. Absolutely. And yeah. you, you were sucking dry in that stuff. So what it does is it allows them to leave the herb out with no botrytis issues. And then the snow keeps it chilled. And then they go they go work the product next April, May when oh. it's it's been off gas because they don't like the fuel so it's funny they don't they don't they don't sift fuel out of the population they know that there's a reason for it because the, the plants seem to produce it in abundance it's just okay. not their type of high they want they want a more yeah. enveloping warmer high yeah. and so they yeah. off gas they basically off gas those those uh metabolites in the field and then they do their sieving and they're doing it with, you know, uh, metal, metal, metal blades for static on big sheets over frames. And when I hung out with um, this, this brother named uh, Seth, so him and um, Saeed, Saeed and Seth are the two brothers, right? So Saeed is the hash making brother. Seth is the one who he said to me, he goes, I am a tea man. He owned a <laughs> small inn. And he was the hospitality guy for the inn that he owned. And so he would make your teas and get yourself all set up. And he was just a, a sweetheart of a young dude. But his older brother was a hash master. And he was, you know, he he broke out some hash. And I was like, ooh, this is beautiful. And he was like, basically, like, with, with, with translation, first pass. So I understood what he meant. It was his first sift. And so the yep. stuff that he brought for us to smoke, and I mean, that shit was so active that when you lit it up, it bubbled like a volcano after you left the room. It didn't stop <laughs> bubbling until it got back to like room temperature. Oh, wow. It was funny. You know what I'm saying? Like it was active yeah. just like a, it, <laughs> there was no plant material in that shit. And then we got yep. to mess with stuff that had plant material in it, but it was still like a high B grade. Yeah. And so high B grade was the lowest grade that I saw, like, a, you know, an 87, 86, 87, you know, was your norm. And then the stuff that we got out of Tierra, when you opened it up, it was just exploding with floral and fruit notes. And it was literally just like bubble gum and consistency. And you pull it out and you'd heat it and smear it and you'd work it. And wow. and I was just, I was trying to smoke my way through half a key of hash, right? 
I was yeah. on a mission to that we were high basically the entire time we were there from morning to night. And <laughs> oh, it was great. And 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 I had brought you know I had brought a whole bunch of papers with me, so I knew because I'm like, we're gonna smoke. But I I couldn't believe that the, in the culture that they have, there's almost there was no traditional like outdoor cannabis grown for consumption. Mm -hmm. But the truth is, is that as soon as you're in the environment, and we've been saying this for years, that it's the environment that dictates how you consume, yeah, that yep. you can't hold cannabis. And they're the masters of preservation. The, the, the Pakistanis, the people in those countries, up in those mountains, they know how to hold butter for 45 years in the ground without making it go rancid. So, yeah. so wait, they create how, these fat yeah. stores. That's why they're working the resin, not the plant. Bingo. When I'm in Colombia... It's different. The climate doesn't break the weed down. And what they want is they want to basically capture the plant in this reefer form. And so Americans, that was what would blew my mind, Ryan, was that in America, our smoking habits were built from consuming Colombian and Mexican cannabis. But when yeah. we went and gathered mm -hmm. the varieties from Asia, we didn't quite catch the fact that those were hash plants and that we should have been making hash. Correct. And we did it. We completely cut the culture. It's so weird. And so now there's this renaissance in hash in America, and I love it. And the only thing that I saw that was kind of like, it, and it, it's just it's just a position, but it's one of people were like, you know, my process is better. And I laugh and I'm like, I challenge you to make hash in the mountain that good on your own if you're so goddamn skilled. <laughs> like, <laughs> with, with some metal blades and a bed sheet. Show me that quality. I want to yeah, see it. Yeah. And so yeah, you it, it's, watching it's this, that since you're a kid and watching your grandpa do it, watching your dad. They've been making it forever. Their familiarity with it was radically different than ours. The way he held the hash in his hand, like when he took the piece of hash out, he hit it with his hand on the table and instantly flattened it out into a, into a patty. He stabs it with the edge of a, 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 a wooden match. And he whips the lighter up and gets the, and just the, but the, it was just so, what are you done at 10,000, 20,000, 30,000 times? Yeah. Like, it, well, like yeah, you can touch yeah. herb a lot. Anybody on this cast, the, the four of us are all competent in herb. We're all competent yeah. in herb. I'm not yeah, saying we have been our life. No, but they we're competent in herb. You can yeah. go anywhere in the world and have a, and have a conversation with somebody at a, at a pretty good level. Yeah, You're, you you understand a whole world of cannabis. It doesn't mean anybody on the cast, including me, is the ever loving end of every inch of the of the kingdom. But yeah. we definitely have experience in it, and we're definitely trying to be professional in what we do. So that means that you've probably seen it more than once. And for me, man, I've been touching hash since eighty. When I watched that guy hit that patty and pop it onto that thing, it, it, I was cracking up because I was like, "Oh my god." He was moving in his fingers and it was rolling through his fingers and the way the way his buddy swirled oh, it into a wow. string and then wrapped that cigarette. I was just like, oh, I got to play with this. <laughs> and, and, and I want to, you know, get the skills and stuff just so I can enjoy the, the relationship that they have with it in the way they do. I'm not a tobacco smoker, but I smoked it in, in every form that I was there so that yeah. I would be able to just see. What was it they want? But I, like I said, tobacco is not my delivery. Cannabis is my delivery. And so we went into cannabis. But once we started showing the hash makers cannabis as flour, they were like, whoa, I've never seen that. Yeah. And, and they said, yep. I want to try it. And they were like, whoa, this is good. And so for <laughs> yeah. them, it was, it, yeah, it was cool. They really enjoyed it because the indoor was really quality. So they weren't smoking some hay. For them, flour gives you a headache. Yeah. It's probably like, moldy. It's contaminated. It's damaged tissue. It's all kinds it's of problems. Not, it's not. Up. It's not meant to be what it is. It just. It, yeah, it yeah. just isn't. I didn't see a lot of mold or rot, and I only really saw of this of the. Say we grab sixty plants, right? When we got back into the hotels or these inns we were staying at, which was killer in its own regard. Mm -hmm. When we went through it, I was going through, and I was letting the guys know. I said, "Listen, if you if you find any plants that have any type of insect issue whatsoever, just let me know. I want to see yeah. it because yeah. what we want to know is that plant doesn't want to be in the collection. Right? Any plant that's a that's a trap for a field, you don't want to bring into your world. Sorry. And so we only mm. found one plant, and it just and had a it had a variety of bugs on it, bugs I had never seen, 
And I should have take, I should have take, I should have done some some ent entomology work and you know done some photographs and shit. But um, uh, I was too busy trying to sift seed, and it was three in the morning when I found it. And so we were just we were sifting and breaking. But I only really found one plant the whole time that I could say like actively had insect issues on it. And okay. I saw so little rot because the climate was so dry and so super dry. Okay. But yeah, so when your tear is wetter and chitrali's wetter. So those regions have a little bit better, I would say, propensity for finding fungal resistance if you're seeking. Yeah. But for me, you know, what I what I was there for was to help them do their hunt. And then sure. I figured while I was there, I would look for some outliers myself just to play with and come home with. You know, and I found some stuff that was absolutely phenomenal. Like what was the craziest outlier? Like what was the thing yeah. that just did not? did not fit yeah. just like this no, is not in the population you, you mentioned because you mentioned some aromas <laughs> that that you that you that uh that you said um uh, and i might be paraphrasing that you didn't feel you had the the nasal like knowledge to olfactory. be able to identify yeah i didn't have the olfactory mm -hmm. memory i haven't yeah. smelled anything like it so i can't describe it I have, to go, I have to go to a Middle Eastern spice store now and I got to go like explore the aromas of an entire different continent that's because so that stuff was crazy and it was so penetrating and so like almost frighteningly strong. It, it, it made you close your eyes and you were almost so, like you were smelling, smelling salts. It was, it made your body so, shake. So we're talking like sharp, like these were like sharper notes. Cause we might not be able to like make a direct comparison, but maybe describing some of the elements of these were these like acrid, like, or sharp, like, was it a oh, sour? Razor sharp, razor sharp yeah. chemical that had been ran through a spice store. Wow. So there was all these really interesting side notes, but there was a chemical smell that was absolutely frightening in one of them and it was the craziest odor ever out of the entire experience that one plant would have been worth the trip by itself there you go and there so and, go. And, it, and it was and with the beauty of it was that when you're hunting stock for like for our regions if this if the plant seed isn't ripe when you're there you just know there's no way it's going to be ripe when it's at your house so what you yeah. need to see is really ripe seed so that you know that the plant and the males all are in a cycle that's kind of similar to us. And so you're in the 30s in Pakistan. We're 39. Humboldt has that similar dry climate in the in the summertime, very, you know, no water at all. And so mm -hmm. I can see why, you know, Humboldt really shined with these genes. And then there was there was 20 plus years ago, I had the revelation that I was in my mind at that moment, I was connected to the Pakistani Afghani people. And I had never even hung out with any. I yeah. had just realized that growing in the mountains, in the in that hill up on the top of that ridge by myself, just sitting there watching the, the falcons hunt. I said, man, this is what dope growers have been doing forever. And it made me feel like I was in that region. So when I built my farm, I really built it to replicate like the visual of Tuscany, Italy. But it was to populate with genes from Asia. Because I knew that it would be ideal. It would be this windy, harsh, hard, hot, dry, cold, rough climate. Yeah. And I just wanted to go see these regions in person. And when I was there, I was like, oh, it, it, that's definitely it, man. Humboldt County lines up with Asia really well. And you can see why the genes moved well. The genes in Mexico and Colombia don't line up with us here as well. You got to take those down to like Paso Robles. You got to get down into San Diego. Because really, that was old Mexico. I mean, shit, Mexico was all the way up in, past the Bay Area. <laughs> Arizona. Yeah. Yep. yeah, you know what I mean? Arizona, places that can really shine with that type of stuff where it just really, really reveals itself. I and, love growing Mexican here. <laughs> oh, I bet. I bet. I would love to see Mexico. Because I got a fascination with Mexican herb after. I mean, I remember, shit, I sold a lot of it. But, um, and I grew a lot of it. But. When I got to go out to Jamaica and mess around with Scott Family Farms, he had a collection of all these different uh, Acapulco Golds and Zacatacas Purples. And and the profiles were just so phenomenally interesting. These sour apples and these deep grapes and just gorgeous, gorgeous pot with, you know, in, intoxicating aroma with rich, rich flavors and really cool high. And I'm just, I'm, I'm, 
you know how it goes. You go, you go through kind of like cycles where you're obsessed with different things. And yeah. after that experience with the, with, the, with all those really kill up the, the Colombian populations were, were cracking too, but it was some of these Mexicans that absolutely caught me because I could almost cultivate them. If my season's <laughs> right, I can almost do it, you know? Yeah. And so there's this idea that maybe it can happen. <laughs> how was the, uh, how that freak outlier you found in Pakistan, how was the flower morphology on it? Was it anywhere close to what could be, you know, and, and did you see anything since EMEA out of the fields? Did you see anything no, that wasn't no. pollinated? We saw, we, saw, we saw a lower seed count in plants that were inside the patches because they would have occluded uh, pollen distribution. For sure. But, yeah. but what we were looking for was every plant that we touched had to have a good frame. It wasn't about short or tall. It was about is the frame. The some of these up. things were so tough that when we, we cut them with like a, you know, a machete and we yeah. had them on the ground and we're trying to rip the branches off. And I almost tore all the skin off my hand pulling on a branch because it was so, the epidural layer was so aggressively spiky. And you couldn't break the branch off the leader, you know? And if you look at all the weed we're working with, they basically shed branches if you breathe on them. Yeah, so is yeah. this like a higher silicate content in the in the soil or? Oh, like, guaranteed the mineral ability. content beyond belief. The, you, the Hunza yeah. is the place where people grow to over 100. So in the world, there's a couple of sweet spots in the in, in the, the, the known world where humans seem to just thrive at an unusual level. And the Hunza is one of them, this valley we were gathering out of. And the it's the Hoopa flat? Glacier. Yeah, it's all flat. All the, It's all glacial flat. fed. Glacial scrape the minerals. And what you yep. have is the high. When you, when you feel the soil in your fingers, it's gritty. You can feel the mineral. So the mineral density in the fruit, when you ate a piece of fruit, you were full. When, yeah. you, when you ate the nut, the nut was almost, you know how when you take walnuts, you almost have to soak them in water to get some of the tannins mm -hmm. to come off and, and yeah. get rid of some of the bitterness to get the sweet out. That's how yeah. it was naturally there. You didn't have to, and the, the shell, you had to break that shit with a hammer. It was so <laughs> tough, but the quality just lit up in your mouth and the flavor of the fruits, the cherries, the plums, the peaches, the apricots. It was like, holy shit. The, the quality of the lamb, the goat, the chicken. It was just so rich. The, the green chilies, all the spices they used were just... They were better because they were in a place where they were, you know, it was funny. I heard the same question someone asked me, like when I was in Colombia, do they use KNF? And I'm like, <laughs> no, no, the Colombians don't use it either. They use a Colombian natural farming, just like the Pakistanis do. They use Pakistani natural farming. Yeah, the Koreans, farm the, the Colombians, the Pakistanis all are in a situation where you can't get inputs. So they rely on regenerative methodology where they cut the crops and leave the waste in the field. They do burns, which gets the, you're basically your biochar into the soil and provides your, your, your pea. They, they uh, use animals. So they're getting, you know, both, both uh, urine and dung. And then the, the animals they're using have the little feet, which kind of break up the soil. And their their crops were incredible like the potato quality was insane i never had better french fries in my life i tripped out i said man well, how come we're not eating potatoes like this it was just and it wasn't that i was starving you know like you're starving and you eat a potato oh my god best potato in the world no we had plenty of food it was just better mineral content and so what we got to see was herb that was tough as shit and so the main thing was every plant had to have a decent chassis it just has to be growable. It had to have good branching. And it wasn't, a, I, so I noted all the, uh, why I chose it. But if it was, if it was pungent, but it wasn't stellar in all these other ways, I didn't look at it because I got 10 million plants to look at, right? So it's sure. not about just grabbing anything. It was like, I'm trying to help them refine their package for 2023 because that's what they're asking me to do. And the, yeah. and the fun part was that these guys were all super talented. So they really didn't need me at all. And, and that's what I was really trying to let them know that you guys don't need me at all. You have all your own skills and they're calibrated. And so what we want to do is just get that message out that the, the people in these other countries, because they're so familiar with the product, they've been touching it for so long 
they just see it differently and they have an ability to say, hey, this one stood out. You know, we looked at, you know, 10 fields over the course of uh, 600 kilometers and these 10 plants just really shined out of the total. We grabbed 50, 60 that were all good. And these right here got the asterisks as incredible. So right. what it does, it allows you to start getting different grades of material out and also outliers are difficult really to work with because you got to go open up a population to find out what's the frequency of that weird trait. Yeah. Right. Cause it wasn't anywhere yeah. else. Uh, so some of these things were like, like, you know, the traditional old school Kush where you think of, you know, cigar box with leather, leather, leather chair and, and yeah. coffee grounds mixed up with some like exotic chocolate and shit. But I mean, turned up 10 oh. times and reeking, so I grabbed a bunch of those because I happened to, I, I, I was just picking those out. And then we got some that were just absolutely disgusting and sweet at the same time. So this really sweet, exotic scent. And then you really got a good odor and it was like a dead cat in the back. Oh, <laughs> and it boy. almost made you choke and gag. <laughs> and you're just like, oh, that's a, real, oh, that's yeah. a good time. <laughs> so, oh, wait. So I, I'm 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 really curious, like uh, with yeah. with this with this old culture that, that we have here, like that has been practiced for so long, and they've had their own like legal difficulties, like we've had in here in the states. But like as far as like like sitting down for for that like for for like a cannabis sesh or for a hash sesh, I guess would be the more like proper terminology. Like what 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 is that? Like what what does that does that look like? I mean, like is it like folks sitting down like in a circle? Like is it just? Is it like, yeah, it I, depends. I, it depends. You're, you're, you're sitting, you're, if you're, you know, most rooms are rectangles. And so basically you're in a rectangular type space most of the time. So mm -hmm. when you come in and then a lot of the places you go to have tea. So tea is woven into the culture. So you gotta remember they're, they're Muslim. So they have this really devout religious belief and they exercise it by how they behave. And the fact that they pray five times a day. So the five prayers a day, kind of coincide with like smoke breaks and tea and it, it's before you know before the dawn comes up first prayer it's when you begin your day and you have tea and then you'll have your smoke and then you'll you'll go through the whole day with these prayers and tea breaks and at the end of the day you know twilight time your last prayer and it's basically like called to go to sleep and start your day again and so they, they've woven the hash consumption in with these breaks. And it's always the same thing. It's like, and they're, they're at nighttime, you see them hitting the tobacco. So they had, it was funny because, you know, mm. we're, we're always using these quasars now for all the hash in the U.S., right? Well, yeah, but. That shit's a, yeah, that's a, that's a, that's a, that's a shisha tool. Yeah. And so when they were smoking the shisha tobacco from the Dubai area, that, that was popular. They were all puffing around and they were all hitting the hose. But the the hash smoking was really all based on tobacco primarily. I don't care where we went. I didn't see anybody whip out a chillum or a pipe or one person had a pipe and it was more like a Moroccan pipe, the long, thin Moroccan pipe where you put oh, the little like, piece. Oh, the, the kiff, the, the, the kiff pipe. Yeah. Yeah. That really long, little delicate pipe. And you just, to you know, you <laughs> toss the end when it goes. And so I saw one of those get broken out, but without question, woven into tobacco, 100%. Right. So they're just well, like making cigarettes and stuff like that. And, and yep. And they're, and then, and they, they, sometimes they share it, but the thing is they all have enough hash, so they don't have to share it. They all sit down and have tea and smoke their own split. This, and I prefer, tell, truth be told, I would rather if we, if three of us hung out, I would rather we all smoked our own joint and mostly because it allows you to control the pace of delivery. Mm -hmm. So this way, if I want to mm -hmm. smoke the shit out of it, 10 hits in a row, I can. And if I don't want to smoke it for five minutes, I don't get yelled at for camping on the joint, right? So I would rather have enough weed to where you can do what you want with that shit and I'm doing what I want with it. And it's not about not sharing the product as much as yeah. it's just in control of your pace of consumption. And so for these guys, it was the same deal where everybody's got hash in their pocket and a pack of cigarettes and someone would yell over, hey, and they'd throw me a cigarette and they would un unroll the cigarette, break the tobacco out. They'd whip some good hash out of their pocket. They'd snap. And there's no difference. You know, you're snapping the plastic that snap to pull the piece of hash out. And then they're heating it up and they're rolling it and stuff. And then they're making it and they're rolling it and they're talking. And then somebody comes in and brings tea. And you sit down and have some really cool tea. 
different tea every place we went, all different types of tea styles. But it was really just a moment to sit down and take a break from life for a second and then go back to your life. They they Did they weave it in with the religion, or was it just a convenient time of day that's just kind of become no? I think the religion dictates it. I think the religion okay. dictates the pace, okay. and and that was the part that like struck me because I had no experience with with really anybody Muslim. I don't no. really have any, I don't really know any Muslims in the U.S. Like not really. Like I know people that are from those regions, but they're not like practicing Muslims. So I don't. I've had a chance to really kind of like dive into a religion, and it let me understand why we're so afraid of the Muslims because there's 1.5 billion of them and their, their whole, their whole like mantra is, you know, one direction means they're all looking the same way towards Mecca. And so when they all pray, you know, you got a billion people around the world praying at the same time, all facing Mecca and the Quran. And, and I'm not advocating good or bad against it. It's just what I noticed as someone who's not from the region. The level of education was interesting because the Quran, you have to learn to read and write in, in order for you to be able to learn the Quran. And so mm. everyone had a command of language that was different. I mean, there's nobody I met that didn't speak like seven different dialects of every region around plus English. Wow. And so, yeah, so they're fluent in like eight languages and they know history beyond belief and the just the entire the entire process is like whoa because their religion says these are the things that are important it becomes woven into their culture and i realized like why westerners go against it because when you when you have 1.5 billion potential people that are united it's a problem especially when they control you know all the minerals and the the the, the oil and all the all the other goodies in the middle east and in asia Man. So it creates this, this interesting story when you get there because what you're seeing is, are you are they all being nice to us because we're us or is it you say no? It's it's because that in our religion we're we're forced to behave well with tourist travelers and strangers. It's just how we were taught since childhood, and as long as you know we're practicing Muslims, that's part of our life. And so yep. I don't care where we went, strangers came up. The only time we had to be careful was when we were in Lahore and it was being in a big town city area and there might be pickpockets. And someone said, ooh, pickpockets. And I'm like, well, that's like Italy. So when you yeah. go to Italy, you got to wear your money in your underwear. And if, you, if you're talking to me, I'm from California and you're like, let me, let me take you for a trip in LA and let me take you for a ride, right? And I'll show you yeah. a horror show that you soon won't forget. <laughs> there was nothing like it in Pakistan. There's, when I was in Jamaica, I was in... Kingston, which is a hood, and 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 then I was in Spanish Town in Kingston, which is the hood of the hood. So your hood squared, you're as hood as it gets in Jamaica, right? And I, me and the security guys that were guarding the farm, we were cracking up. I'm rolling with these guys, and I'm like, they're like, you know, how you feel? I said, this is great. It's better than California. Way less, way less crime. There's not a single person in the street overdosing on dope with a needle hanging out their arm. I'm not seeing any shit or pee. I'm just like, this is so much cleaner than California and so much less problem that I actually feel better here than I do at home. <laughs> and, it, and, and that's a weird thing to say. Humble, Humble's cool, but like when you go to San Francisco or Los Angeles, baby, you better get ready to see the hood. And it's <laughs> it's filthy. And, and it, it's shocking because I don't care where I go. I don't see that. Lahore has got 14 million people in it, right? They oh, don't have okay. a single traffic sign, traffic light, stop sign, shit on the street. And cars are moving in, in a wave of traffic that you just can't describe to somebody. And they all talk with the horn, letting them know <laughs> what's, they're going on the left or the right. And it's this flow of life that's moving like a river. You couldn't have that shit in the U.S. if you tried, man. Everybody be getting out of the car having road rage. Yeah, yes, that, that, so, is, a, that is a fact. <laughs> so the religion, the religion kind of creates some guidelines. And 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 it's and like I said, it, and, and I had people say, well, there's all these other problems with it. I said, listen, listen, I'm just saying what I see that I'm able to comment on, right? I'm not a, I'm not 
a religious expert. I'm not there to study the religion. I'm just trying to notice that in general, I see these pieces of it, that it creates a structure and a guideline and the people weave the, their lives around that. They don't fit God into their lives. They fit their lives into God. And I really couldn't quite catch the significance of this relationship until we were in a landslide in the Kurukuram when we're on the road, right? And all of a sudden the road whites out in front of us. And I'm like, what the hell is that? And I'm thinking, I'm laughing, me and the other guys in the car are like, ah, they must be doing road construction right now. Who do road construction <laughs> right now on roads like this with this thing? Then all of a sudden the smoke clears <laughs> and there's a, there's a rock that had hit a wheelbarrow right next to us and flattened it like a pancake. So I knew that that rock was not in that wheelbarrow prior. And we realized that that rock had come down and hit the ground right next to us. And it was the size of a fridge. And it hit so hard, it blew that white dust. And we said, whoa, this shit's active today. So we finished climbing over the mountain. We start going down the other side and it's dark now. And the whole road is backed up with traffic, like maybe a hundred cars on this little deadliest roads you ever seen in your life. Like this is no, you make a mistake, you're going to die. And it had a kicked out, huge slide had come. And one of the Pakistani brothers with us, an Imanas, he got a voice like Moses, or at least the voice I think Moses had. And he gets out of the car and he's like, together, we shall move the rocks. <laughs> and I'm telling you, it, it came out bellowing, man, like he had a bullhorn. <laughs> It was, and you know, he's this bearded dude. The only thing he was missing was like the commandments in his hand. <laughs> and everybody jumped out their rigs and they cleared the road of these huge boulders and shit to get the cars over. And it was this life and death experience to get the rigs over it. And me and the cameraman are walking away like, man, this is, this shit's crazy. And he's filming. And all of a sudden he had these sounds like ding, 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 ding. And I'm like, oh, the little rocks are still coming down the hill. Then all of a sudden I hear, shoo, shoo. And I realize there's rocks the size of like softballs and cantaloupe flying by our heads. And I'm like, holy shit. So me and the cameraman, we start running for our lives, right? And Rolf is hysterical because he's chill. Man, he abs that dude was a sprinter. He ran right by me down the road full steam like he was not going to die that day on the road. <laughs> And we get past the slide, we get in the rig, and then we go have dinner. <laughs> and it was while we were having dinner, right? Yeah, we have dinner. I mean, like, it's like, yeah. okay, we survived. And yeah. it was then I so, understood this phrase that was always used, and it was, it was inshallah, meaning with Allah's will. And I'm talking to the Pakistani, one of my partners, Numi, that um, was, he's a land race genetics, but he was just a, he's a, a brilliant dude, man. He's sharp as a fucking razor. And he was just really a good guy. And I was with him the whole time. So he was like the driver I rolled with. So we spent, you know, three weeks together hanging out. And I was, so I'm trying to learn from what I'm seeing. And I'm trying to like come upon it upon myself so that I can then ask them, like, am I seeing what I'm seeing? Yeah. And it was this reality of man's plans and God's plans. And I realized that when you live in the mountains, you live in any place that's absolutely life and death at any minute, you really realize you're not in control and that you have to hand over your life to a higher power or you're never going to have the faith to try to cross the ridge. You have to believe. And then that's when I realized it was the same thing with the 12-step programs of drug addiction and alcoholism. You have to turn your life over to a higher power. It doesn't mean Jesus. It doesn't mean um, uh, Allah. It, it means a higher power. It means that the world is bigger than you. And if you can accept it and allow that to guide you, it should allow you to be able to see yourself in the right context, that you're just a small piece of a big picture, but you're an important piece and that your job is to be as good a person as you can be. But at the end of the day, you're not in control because the rock that came down and crushed that wheelbarrow next to our car, that shit was like, I'm talking, it happened right in front of us. So I didn't see the rock hit. I just saw the dust cloud. Well, the dust cloud came. So, I mean, we were right there. So all we had to do was be three seconds later yeah. and then five foot over. And we would have had a refrigerator. I, I would have got crushed because I was in that seat. Yeah. And I'm just like, whoa. So it caught me and it helped me just understand that when you're, when you're in a situation where you can't rely on technology, you still relied on spirituality. Yeah. And what we did is we replaced spirituality 
this belief that we're all connected on a on a higher level that all humans that reside on earth are all connected as a human organism and we start going into who's got the most money and who's got the net most technology and that's what's most important and the truth of it is that creates total isolation and a total separation from each other so social media is meant to connect people it turns out to be one of the greatest dividers you've ever seen because Anybody who's existing on this shit full time can't have a conversation in public. Yeah, yeah, it mm-hmm. definitely, definitely makes it for a challenging um, situation. I mean, I know. I mean, like, I, my mind right now is just jumping to that story, like uh, with, with with the traveling on, on on the cliff, and and I, I I imagine that after that whole ordeal happening, like I I would want I would want to smoke some hash, like after that. I was like, yeah, let's get oh, some we, dinner. I was smoking it while it was happening. I had <laughs> the joint in my mouth. When we were walking down the hill. I rolled one up while we were waiting. I'm like, yeah. we're just chilling, right? So yeah. I was rolling. I mean, we're rolling bombers. I brought big papers yeah. just because I knew that I was gonna want to play. Yeah. And so we're we're smoking. When those rocks came down, I had the joint in my mouth, and I just covered the side of my face with my hand so that if a rock hit me, it wouldn't blind me. Yeah. And we're running Man. for our lives. But when I got to the end of the pass, Rob's cracking up because I still got the joint in my mouth, <laughs> and so we're still puffing on it. Well, you know. Yeah, because you imagine smoking gas. Life, Can you smoke? You imagine smoking gas during all of that, though. Like, I mean, with how Ooh. stimulating uh, that. You imagine having an anxiety attack. Like, <laughs> you know, yeah. I mean, that might be one of the reasons why they're like, "Yeah, we don't want the gas." Like, try no, you, no, you, you they, try they, being they, on the mountain with that gas. Like, yeah, <laughs> they, what they want is they want to relax and they want to be able uh, to feel good, and they they need to be able to use it in the way that works for them best. So that was what was so interesting was, you know, they they off gas it so that they get rid of the profiles that we're addicted to. And that's the funny thing is that the Europeans. So there's like a hash revolution in the U.S., which I think is just fascinating. And I love the fact that it's so many of these small craft two light two light cats with the tent that they're mm-hmm. just creating some some rosin and some and some full melt out of their tents. That's incredible. And I love it. I love to see the differentiation where they're like, hey, I want to smoke an extract, but I want to make it myself in my home. And so I love the revolution. And then in Europe, you see it, too, where you're starting to see the rosins and the hash competitions that are really coming out. And it's just that that's still a limited market, because at the end of the day, regular individuals can't handle the impact of smoking some of this volatile weed. Some of this some of the high potency herb is too strong to, like, go back to work on. And so we're like, no, it's not. Yeah, but you guys, because that's that's us. Where we're, we, we've been, you know, it's almost like if I hang out with someone that's a moonshiner, and they're like <laughs> drinking moonshine, and you take two thimbles of that shit, and you're about to like first burn up from the inside out, and then you're hanging on to the car door because you think you're just gonna fall out the window. You're so smashed, and you had basically thirty mil. <laughs> you know what I mean? You had a fucking tablespoon of it, right? <laughs> So, I mean, we're talking, I mean, real moonshine is savage, but you're hanging out with moonshiners and they're talking about the differences of the flavor profiles. And I'm like, there was no flavor to that shit. It was straight (laughs) heat. Gasoline. And so I think that's us. I think that's us as the Americans is that, you know, we're we're fired up on brutally high octane products. Mm, And culturally, that's where we want to be. But it doesn't allow everyone who consumes to be at that same comfort level and i think that you know when you look at it, it's and i said it's not it's it's majority of europe is fed by morocco lebanon and afghanistan pakistan and so in india you know so all of these products are different in the way that of the intensity and how they consume them and it allows those people to be able to smoke and still have some functionality but you know you're burning a high level rosin you're not running right back into the machine shop to touch the mill you know, you don't, and if you're, and if you're blazing rosin, I'd rather you not drive in the damn bus. Let's yeah. call it what it is. Like, come on, let's be honest. Hey, I'd rather yeah. you not be blasted out of your mind driving the bus on the cliff. Yeah. So um, <laughs> I can handle you smoking a hash cig, but you know, you're, 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 you're hitting, you're hitting BHO in the back. You're, you're definitely lit. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And no. I'm not Notice against any of it. I smoke all of it. I just know that there's things that I don't do when I consume some of those products. Yeah. You're not gonna see me run a fucking skill saw. 
You're not going to see me go take some rips on the BHO pipe and then go fucking bring a tree down with a chainsaw. <laughs> like anything that requires like really high level mental acuity, I might burn a joint. I could burn a joint before work and function. But if I touch a really high level extract, I know that it's changing me. And I'm not against the change, but it has to be appropriate for what I'm doing. And so I just mm -hmm. know that we're different. The U.S. is a different consumption pattern than most places. Yep. <laughs> I noticed the same thing in India when they were rubbing even the chara. So, like, you've got the fresh plant, right? It's super terpy. They don't like smoking it fresh right off the hand, especially the cream. They want it to age. They want it to off-gas. They want it to change. So it's not that it's burning your nose. Like when you were smoking fresh charas, it was burning your nose. Yeah. How long do they age it for? What's that process, Ryan? Typically, I mean, now because they're selling so much of it or they're consuming so much of it, it's like one year. We, we found one guy that had some two year old and that was, that was a very, very small, like half a tola. So, and that was just like his head stash, but he did share it with us. But the I oldest like we saw was two years. That's very nice. But it, again, it's just that more even bodied, you can approach things differently, and that's just it. They're hiking on the hillsides, and it's completely vertical. Every step oh, yeah, you take, yeah. you roll up, up. You die. Yeah, Those you kids. roll down, you're you're done. You're not you're stopping done, you're until done. you hit the river bottom. And so Ooh. they're not trying to get completely faded. They need to be functional, but they need pain relief because they're also hiking 60, 70 pounds of, of weed plants or grass or gravel or moving donkeys or goats it's or whatever. Yeah, yeah, no, human power. Yeah. Exactly. So they, they need the relief. They need the comfortability. They need the adaptability to the environment, but they can't get smashed and then go do their work so that they're prepared for the whole winter season. They've, they've got to work all the days of the sunlight hour. They got to get something done. So yeah, no, because once yeah. the winter comes, it's over. It's That's over with. Yeah. Once the winter comes, it's over. There was, there was this place we went that was a fort and it was where they sifted out their, their military people. Right. And it was this pool. And they said, if you could swim underwater the length of this pool, you would be like able to be in the military. And, and I, I, I was a diver in the military, right? And so I like, I stuck my hand in the water and said, hey, I think I could handle this temperature right now and swim the duration. And the, the guide laughed and he goes, no, no, Kev. We do it in the middle of winter when it's a frozen ice sheet. <laughs> and we drill two holes yeah. and you have to go in one and find the other. And I started laughing because all I could think about was how many bodies were inside that yeah. pool. And right. that if you could do that, you were strong enough to be in the military because none of the ice rivers would stop you from crossing them. And yeah. you're, you're, until you're in the mountains there, you just re like, and, and I've seen a lot of altitude. I've been all over the world. It was just so huge and so monstrous and so steep that all you could think of was like, how the hell did humans ever make it through this shit? And the Hindu Kush, man, I learned that the, the Kush really is killer. So it's the Hindu killer is what that meant. Because when you went through the Hindu range, the bandits would come down and kill you. And so they named it the Hindu killers was that region. I said, man, is that why we call the Kush the kill? Is that like, <laughs> it's, you know, yeah, because none of us, cannabis is, is one of those things where we all got to kind of, play you know what's that game you play when you when you're next to somebody it's like telephone where they whisper something in your ear and you whisper it in yeah, someone's ear yeah that's cannabis to me. you adapt it yeah yeah and, and at the end of the day the message is radically different because there was no source and you couldn't prove anything because you'd have to out someone to do it so most of the stuff we know is in that form and, it, you know, it was just so interesting when you get a chance to see the roots of the world we're in today. And it just allows you to understand where we are and where we're going and the fact that every product is valid. It, it, you know, it, it there's you go from a thousand milligram edible, which which there's people who definitely need and should have access to. And then there's the three milligram edible, which is perfect for people who have need and should have access to as well. Mm -hmm. You should have you should have state of the art. What do they call that shit? Piatella that, you know, they, you know, they're taking that hat, you know, they, the, the super the hash now, right? Yeah. Everything's cold cured. Made. It's like the plant yeah. was, the, the plant was, was made by an angel. Um, <laughs> that, oh that, that product's, that product's pretty nice. Right. And that's a killer product, but that doesn't mean traditional products from other countries don't work and they're not, they're not good. And the yep. markets that need them and desire them and, and want it. And so at the end of the day, you know, what, the hope was really was that 
the recreation of the silk route was one that was equitable where yeah. the route that created the back and forth can we recreate it again but through like craft cultivators just what you experienced you yeah. went and preservation I, let them do their thing that they know how to do and, and just preserve that it doesn't yeah. have to morph it doesn't have to change you don't no, have to make it no. different yeah. It's nothing. It's about recognizing it for what it is and not trying to say it's better or worse than me. It's about saying that that there's many ways to look at this and that when you choose it, you're not wrong. Yep. It's your choice and the ability for us as cultivators to connect and not compete because at the end of the day, all of us global craft cultivators are getting screwed. And so mm -hmm. I don't care what country I'm in. If you're a small cultivator, you're getting screwed. And the yeah. ability for us to be able to work together in that form and then also to create the living gene banks that allow stock to to stay alive that might get wiped out and it's it's as simple and no it's not in its indigenous location so yeah it's going to change but it, it it caught me because i got a friend that's a coral preservationist he does coral preservation work and I used to work out all along the Marshall Islands, the Gilbert Islands, the Solomon Islands. I used to map reefs, right? So I used to do all kinds of work in on reefs when I was in the military, you know, back in the 80s. Yeah. So I spent a shitload of time underwater mapping reefs. And so I know what diverse coral looks like. And then I, and I started to see the destruction of the coral. And I realized, like, wow, this is uh, going to change. And in my lifetime, it, it'll really be radically different. And so what you find is you got all these people that are coral enthusiasts that trade frags, which is what they call the piece of coral that they stick to a piece of glass with some silicone in a tank and they grow the coral and then they can ship the coral all over the world. And they're saying, hey, we're really the bank of coral that doesn't yeah. exist in the natural world. And for me, yep. I'm like, hey, maybe us as craft cultivators, what we are is we're the bank of, of genes that that have a uh, less security and we're keeping them because we're interested in them, not because they fit a COA. It, exactly. It's, it's, it's not about like, well, you can't sell that. I'm like, I'm, I'm not trying to. Someone's like, you know, that it, it won't fit in the commercial market. I'm like, I'm not trying to get in the commercial market. There's plenty of shit in the commercial market already. I'm in the fucking commercial market. Yeah. You're, what you're failing to realize is that the, the, the home consumer market, is one who would like diversity because I was here when there was diversity. I was here prior to the change. I know what it looked like to have 300 choices in a dispensary that were different, not 300 choices that reflected 14 different plants relabeled. So yeah. that, that was real. And the system screws it up because of the way distribution fit factors in and, and, and the, the education of the consumer. The people who aren't buying at the store, they just want good herb. And if they can get things that are cool and fun and they're able to work on something that's different and they find something that's incredible that they have, they love, they'll hold on to it for time. They don't flip varieties. When I give plants to people to bank, I don't give them to ball or dudes or, or chicks. I give them to the regularest person I know. The person who just says, Kev, I love that plant. I just always wanted a copy. Could I have a copy? Because you know that eight years later, they'll still have the damn copy. Yeah, and that just sounds kind of like what was um, going on in um, in Pakistan um, as well, as far as like the different the different um, villages, the different areas, like sharing genetics. They share the I, genes. I, yeah. I asked them. I said, "Do you guys monopolize your crops? Like, are you are you competitive? Are you trying to only have a certain thing?" And they're like, "No, we all want to do well." And we all know that the best shit should be should be shared. And at the end of the day, if you inbreed a crop too much without outcrossing, you decrease the vigor. And so they stabilize crops because you basically see two populations, green and purple, two populations, right. tall and short or medium. Right. So nothing too short. That would be more like Lebanon. So medium and tall, purple and green. And then you got a couple of reds in there and a couple other, you know, shades of color. But pretty much we're saying what's the big population breaks? Pretty simple. And the idea of taking crops from one region and weaving it into the other so that you're always having survivability. Because when your primary concern is making it through the winter with enough seed to eat and enough um, resin to make as medicine, enough resin to smoke so that you can deal with the fact that it's freezing ass cold your 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 desires are different so it was really awesome because 
it was the first time I'd ever seen that. The Colombians aren't hunting the seed for food. So when I worked in the Americas, mm. that wasn't what they were using it for. They, they have abundant food. You're in the Americas. You're not starving in Colombia. I don't give a shit. You're in the rainforest. It is a cornucopia of choices. But man, when you get into the cold, what can make it? So it was cool how every potato field had like a well that they created in the middle of the potato field filled to the brim with potatoes. They just they just took all the potatoes, basically dusted them off and threw them in the ground and pull them out perfect. And so yep. there was always these storage vessels. And then they had the butter they wrapped up and they said, no, nah, we, we store the butter. It was the fat. They need the fat. You need the fat to stay warm in the winter. You need to have fat source and you need it for lubrication. So there's no shortage of clean water. The shit's flowing everywhere and it, it, it couldn't be any clean. I mean, holy shit. It was the bluest, clearest, craziest looking water I've ever seen. It even had like white lines running in it from the calcium deposits that were squirting into it. It was, you what? just wish you had, uh, you wish you had that shit to grow weed at home with. Do you know oh. what I'm saying? Like, that's why I brought yeah. the soil samples. Dreams I actually had somebody ask me to get the soil for them because they're connected to, um, uh, Indian Land Race Exchange. So they, they're they a friend of the group. And I know those guys too. I know most of the land race groups because I try to be friendly with all of them because at the end of the day, we're all trying to bring attention to preservation. Yep. We're all putting it's in good about expl- Yeah, it's preservation. It's, mm-hmm. and, and I use my platform to talk about it. And then I take the work and I share it. And I don't monetize it. I, I do it as a favor so that what we have is we have better relations. Thank right. you for the Nazi, by the way. Beautiful. Yeah, no plant. doubt. No, thank you. Because you kicked so me a whole bunch of killer agree. hybrids back, but you you understood what I was doing because you also did the same thing. You're you're saying, hey, because you want to know the truth, that population doesn't exist. That region got wiped out from uh the, the Taliban. No. And so that that area doesn't exist anymore. You can't collect there. So that stock that we have, it really does reflect maybe it's the last of it in a, in that That's form. So yeah us sharing it and bringing attention and it's not the jam of a, a group it, it, we, you, when people talk about you know preservation and how someone said yeah political instability and all these regions wiped out their stock and i'm saying bro you're talking to me i'm american I mean, we went through <laughs> a drug war where we stamped out not only the american shit but everybody's shit and yeah. Yeah. Now, um, I think we got uh, uh, some questions in, um, in, in the chat. They're, they're not popping up in our direct feed here, but um, through our Facebook live stream, there's oh, yeah, a bunch yeah, coming through. Up. I think um, Kelly is uh, keeping an eye on that. She said she found some uh, some, some good, relevant ones. They were just popping up. Yeah. So uh, Ghislaine Ball asks, are women included in production and or consumption rituals? If not, do they have their own traditions? Yeah. The, the, the thing was, what they have is that, you know, because we're Westerners, so when you when you see kids up to puberty, girls are running everywhere playing with with boys. It, it, they run around. You're seeing little girls everywhere. But as soon as they get up to puberty, then they they're only allowed to be hanging out with family members and no strangers. And so and and however they came about with this form, it's just how it is. And so you see all the women working together in the fields. And then when we would come in they would they would turn and wait for us and we would then say oh i got you we're disturbing their work because we're westerners we're strangers so they don't have the ability to integrate with strangers in that capacity but then we got to meet a girl who was like a pharmacist and so she was in I'm trying to think what city we were in when we hooked up with her but she was bright but she was like a modern pakistani gal oh, wow. and she came by oh yeah she was hella cool and yeah. she came by with some killer yeah. hash too and she was doing the same thing. She was rolling up her own hash bombers. She had her all her own shit. And, you know, she was talking about the the change in the culture over time and how, you know, historically this is how the culture had functioned because it just kept the strife down among the men. Mm-hmm. And at the end of the day, and that's what I tell my daughter, I got a, I got a 10 year old and I say, listen, I said, the, the problem isn't women, it's men. <laughs> we're the ones that have the yeah. issues and so it's it's really not about what you do it's just understand that there's many people that are going to look at you very differently because of it and you're going to invite people into your life you really don't want and that's a problem and i said and it shouldn't be that way i said you should be able to wear whatever you want you should be able to walk out of your goddamn house naked and not have any issues but the fact of the matter is that's difficult for a woman period 
-hmm. And so the, 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 the hanging out with the boys type thing, we're not local. So we're not hanging out with any of the women. We weren't with women mm -hmm. except for when we got into the cities and the land race team brought women to meet us that were, I would say like modern Pakistanis where they, they were wearing clothes that weren't like traditional and they were definitely not behaving traditional in terms of being bold of their lifestyle, but they were razor sharp. I mean, really oh, wow. educated and sharp and tell, Oh fuck everybody. Everybody yeah. was right. That was the part yeah. that blew my mind. We're hanging out with this kid, Shem and Shem was like, he was our guide. Right. And he's kind of halting English. And he's talking about living in the village his whole life and how this other village has problem with his village from like 200 years ago, we had beef and we still have a minor beef and I'm cracking up. <laughs> but he goes, but I speak the language. And I said, oh, and they have a different language. He goes, yeah, he goes, every one of these regions around us have a different language. And I said, how many of these languages do you speak? He goes, fluently eight. And I started laughing and I said, okay, when you speak in eight fluid languages, um, your, your brain's working just fine. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the, the women were, were really bright too. And it's just that because we were Westerners and like when we got into elevators and stuff, even when we were in high level hotels, when we got in the elevator, if there was Pakistani women in the elevator, if we all got in as men, they would leave. So what we just, we started to understand, just give them their space. But there was women everywhere when we were in the cities, but when you're mm -hmm. in the villages, it still follows a more traditional piece. Yeah. And I don't really know what the, like, I know what smoking with the gal we smoked with. I mean, shit, she was pulling out hash and spinning up snakes on tobacco and puffing down and listening to the music with us and talking about, you know, cultural shit of, of Pakistan. So I see the changes emerging because like all countries as, and, and you know, and it's, it's, it's not a good thing or a bad thing. It's just that the United States creates through Hollywood, the vision. So success is basically what Westerners do. So at the end of the day, the projection that we create of this is what you do as a Westerner, this is success, this is clothing, this is fashion, this is style, these are habits. That shit infiltrates every culture I've been to. Yeah. And so yeah. you're seeing the changes because it's the upper level people, their kids don't want to comply to the same degree. And yeah. so I'm sure it's just that because we were foreigners, it, it, it's, you're separated from it. But you know, when we were in the villages and it was different, we were in the cities, man, there was women everywhere, but they were all walking together and they're wearing traditional stuff. And, and for the most part, their faces were uncovered. And then there was some, there was some gals that were most definitely from like stricter sex and they wore like full cover. And, and they were doing their work. They're working in the market. They were doing their thing. And so it's just how they worked out their issues. And, and it's, it's a tough one too, because like I said, in the U S there's this idea that we're all free, but I'm like, you know, I, I think our uh, level of crime against women is pretty high. If we measured it, I'm not quite sure what it is, but I would say on average, um, I'm not, I'm not eager to let my daughter go run around by herself someplace. Yeah. So, so that was the difference was like, you didn't you didn't see any of the issues because the people were basically policing themselves to a degree and by keeping the 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 women in that form it allowed them to control their own problems so it, i don't think it's fair that women have to be controlled because men can't control their problems it's just that that's how that society built its culture yeah and uh, so the next question is, how early in the day Pakistanis bake? Oh, as soon as they wake up. Wow. <laughs> yeah, they're puffing all day. They're they're they if they're if they're if they're a hash smoker. Oh, they're smoking all day. They're but they're smoking like in 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 you know five different increments through the day. Okay. And and then at nighttime, you know, they're hanging out, listening to music, and and chilling with their friends and then they wake up and start the day again. But they wow. different than us. Like we, we yeah. carry weed with us so that like we're smoking continuously. They, they, they kind of smoke in, in sections where this is a smoke break and then it's time to go work in the field, yeah. work on the projects, work on the animals, work on the crafts, whatever they're yeah. doing. Sheila Jeet hunters, guys that are hunting Sheila Jeet. Yeah. Whatever it is you're doing, you're doing. And and even then, some of those tasks are so difficult that it's impossible to pray. You can't pray when you're hanging on a rope on the side of a mountain. And so because of that, what it says is that you 
can pray in the morning and say, you're sorry that you're not going to be able to be a better um, advocate for Allah during the day, but he understands real life too. So go hang on your rope and go gather your shilajit. Yeah. And it, so it was a, it was a workable functional system, just like the consumption. So they weren't like forced to like, we got to smoke. But Americans are almost like junkies where if you ever go to any, any dab lounge or dab bar, man, people are basically elbowing each other out of the way to get back on the pipe. Like yeah. that's some funny shit. And uh, yeah. oh, wow. if there's a VIP bar, if there's any of that crap, man, there's like full-time consumption going down. And so their approach is different because they're, they have, you know, kilo of hash and a kilo of hash is like 150 us. Yeah. So, you know, you're talking, yeah. And, and, wow. and the average Pakistani makes like, you know, 1500 us a year, someone making good money in Pakistan, you know, making six grand us a year. So 150 for a key of hash at the hash bazaars and all the different levels, but, they're making this shit, right? So just like us in Humboldt, people are horrified. We had a student come in and he, and, and it was funny, but it, it, he was like, hey, he goes, you know, people like me are almost offended by you, Swami, because, you know, you're smoking like these four gram joints. And, and for us, that's like a whole week's worth of smoke. And he's like, yeah, but, but I'm not showing off, my friend. I just have this much weed. Yeah. So if you had this much weed, you'd be smoking it like that too. You, yeah. would, you would smoke it different. You would have a different relationship with it because it wasn't money that controlled your consumption. Yeah. Sure. And so for us in Humboldt, we always made shit. There's weed all over the fucking place. There's table full of in front of me. There's never not weed somewhere. There's never not weed somewhere. <laughs> There's more ash. I mean, look at my desk because I get the shit hanging all over the fucking house in the garage. So we, we approach it different. And so I, I like the way they smoked with it. And, and I kind of follow it myself where I, I don't really, I try to smoke like in, in increments and it lets me evaluate better the smoke because mm -hmm. it lets me feel the come down. I want to know what happens when I drop off the drug. I don't want to have to stay at this level continuously because as soon as I come down, I don't want to feel the exhaustion. And so yeah. good products don't do that. When you come off of it, there's a balanced after effect. So that's kind of what I seek is really balanced after effect because you're going to get lifted. But what happens when you're done? Do you have to go right back to the pipe? And that's yeah. not what I'm seeking. And so for them, because they have enough hash of, of that works for them and they can smoke as much as they need. If they need to smoke two cigarettes worth, they can. It's not mm -hmm. money stopping them from smoking the hash. Yeah. yeah, it sounds almost like they've developed that they, they developed a relationship with with hash uh, akin to how a lot of uh, us in America have developed a relationship kind of with with alcohol. Because like I know with me in college, I was all about like drink as much as I can. And then literally yeah. the second I turned 21, I no longer gave a crap about getting my hands on alcohol because it was so ubiquitous. Like for, yeah. for me, I was just like, oh, well, now I don't care about Mm -hmm. drinking a whole whole lot I, I mean i'll have a beer or two if i feel like it. it's it's cheap it's everywhere it's like and and no one's judging me for it i'm not going to get the door kicked in just because i'm having one Holy. <laughs> it was a trip to have a no alcohol culture i've never i was only in a no alcohol culture once in my life when i was working out in truck so i was working out in the solomon islands in this place called truck and they have no alcohol out there they they, they brought alcohol to the islands wreaked havoc with the natives they just said no more. The the government, right. the people said, look, this shit is toxic to us because we don't have the enzymes to process it. And it absolutely wreaks havoc. So there was no alcohol anywhere. And I was young then. So you kind of wanted a beer. But in in this in this situation, no alcohol was like nobody was really inflamed or angry. And so nah. it was kind of cool to see like a hash culture and no alcohol culture because Everybody's smoking hash. They chill in. And what I liked was you go to like a place to eat. And when you went in and ate, you know, you'd, you'd all you'd take off your shoes. You'd come in and sit down on these uh, carpeted like spots. And then they would bring in this roll. They'd roll out. And then all the food would be in, you know, in, in hot pots put on top of the roll. And then you would be able to just scoop the food out. And you had silverware, but you learned how to use naan, the bread and make a scoop. Like you started learning yeah. how to use the, it was kind of cool, man, all the different types of naan. You learn yeah. all the different types of regional uh -huh. bread baking techniques. Yeah. And this is basically so flatbread, mm -hmm. but it, it lets you, 
it lets you chill. And then when you're done, you kick back and there's pillows and you lay back and let the food digest. And then they bring in the tea and you drink the tea and then you go outside. And while you're in those spaces, you can smoke the hash too. So like at the end of the meal, you're, you're puffing down and it's just really, it was woven in, in a way that was just really balanced. And I, and I, and I, and I, I just know that because the drug war was so brutal to us, it skewed our relationship with weed and it's going to take us some time of, of access and normality to where people just see each other as craftsmen. So like in America, you know, you, you basically burn a flag, burning a fire to let everybody know who you are. And these guys have been making hash for, you know, 1500 years and they're just hash makers. They didn't say I'm the best hash maker. I'm the only hash maker. We make the finest shit. Our shit's proprietary. My technique is, you never heard a single word other than, oh, I make hash. What do you do? <laughs> I have a four acre patch that I hand sieve myself. And oh, you're just like, well, wow. that's a hash maker. You're hand sieving four acres of herb. And then you go work and help your other friends sieve their hash. Yeah. It was cool. You know what I mean? Like, Ryan, you experienced it too. The, the, the yeah, people have a different much, relationship. Oh, how much work they put in to make that Ooh. hash. Oh, my. <laughs> God, they work hard, bro. They work that hard. is, that was the one thing that kind of like really gave me a, a fucking like a ego check was like in America, there's just like you were saying, there's herb everywhere. We're making every product we can think of. We're trying to find a new way to fractionate, distillate, you know, just anything we can do to make a new cool product. And then these people are putting in hours a day to make, to make handfuls of hash, you know, and like, it's just how much work goes into it is give you a new appreciation for yeah. the, the consumption. You know, it's like, man, especially if you were smoking like some super cream, some Milana super cream, it's like these people put in hours out of the day, a full eight hour shift, 10 hour shift to make 10 grams, 20 grams for somebody who's really fast. So it's like, it gave you a new it's appreciation. Insane. And they get paid yeah. nothing for it. It nothing. tripped me out. Uh, 100 us was worth 29,000 uh what was the currency of uh, pakistan i want to say what was the name of the the, the money monetary form but it was about 29,000 to to 100 bucks wow and you know you're talking 100 bucks is a month's worth of money for a pakistani right ah, so you the pakistani rupee yeah the rupee right so you make the conversion oh. and you're just like holy shit so the cost of everything was so cheap yeah. And we were picking up the, the land race crew, you know, they, they're, they, they're Pakistani. And so when we went to all the villages, you know, we had all brought gifts and goodies. I brought slingshots, a bunch of slingshots and stuff. Cause my, my, my father yeah. owns, owns a sporting goods store. So I brought really cool slingshots with extra rubber bands and shit. Oh, so like yeah. when you broke the rubber, yeah, yeah. Good ones. And, and the BBs, all that shit. So they could have fun and all kinds of little folding knives and stuff, but good ones, ones that, you know, like you can't get out there. And when they held it, they were like, ooh, that's a nice knife. And so we were just sharing it with people we were messing with. Because I didn't know how to be nice to them, so I didn't know what to give them. But typically, um, most people like, most kids like slingshots. And most uh, people working in the field like knives. And then we had, yeah. you know, cases of, of, you know, different kinds of candy and stuff we would give to the kids when they ran up. And you, you'd kick them a couple lollipops and hang out. And they were just little kids like us. It was It was just... It was really nice just to see they they have a very different system. The people are are tougher because they don't have the safety net that we do, right. and that's the thing. The U.S. the U.S. has a safety net, but for the people that fall through it, they experience horrific life too. So anybody who's yeah. having a bad time is having a bad time. It isn't like it's a worse time in Africa. If you're starving or you haven't been you being mistreated, I don't give a shit what country you're in. It sucks. So yeah, you don't have to be isolated, all that. That's why these cultures just stick together so much and they're so diplomatic and they, they converse out in the open and they like, they just figure their shit out so they can move on to the next day. Yes, because they're, the problems are too big not to. And so when you can bitch about your situation, it was like somebody asked one of the elders, you know, was your childhood hard? And he didn't know how to respond because he just knew he had a childhood. He was like, what, like compared to what? And they were like, yeah. you know, what's your view of the outside world? And he's like, well, I know the village down the way. I think they're similar to us, but I've never been there. Because he didn't need to. He didn't give a shit. He was living in his village and he was happy. Yeah. And it, yep. was, it was like Rumi. You know, it was like when you're reading Rumi, the poet, 
And he's like, if you, if you know your, if you know your village, you know, the world. And it was really the truth that it's when you have the ability to really look at your life and then say what you like and what you don't like, it lets you know you're entitled to even have that opinion. Yeah. And, and so many don't. And so when you get to be around it, it just kind of, it helps you just understand that struggle is universal and, and respect is universal. And at the end of the day, what we're trying to do is respect the struggle of other people and not compare and compete with them in that regard. And once you do, then you're able to really start to suck up some really interesting details about life. And yeah. they can also benefit from yours because it lets them have a chance to be your friend, which lets them see the West in a way they wish they could. They, they yeah. want the access. They want the relationships. We're trying and, to get Ravi, one of our hosts that had a homestay out there. We're trying to get him out here to the States. So he can, can see some commercial American cannabis. Yeah. Oh, that'd be he incredible. Said, no, I said yeah. the same thing. I wish we could bring Saeed out because I'd love to take him over to, you know, um, any of my, like, uh, you know, I know Lena and, uh, yeah. Le, you know, and so Lena, Lena is, and, and it's funny because there's a tremendous number of incredible hash makers that I know. It's just yeah. that Frenchie was a traditional hash maker. And so his protégés because they're not apprentices anymore they're full-blown good at what they do no. his protégés they have they're carrying frenchy with them and so yeah. for them to hang out with someone who is a traditional maker from another country would be fun because they're not going to compare and compete with technology they're just going to share like the resin yeah gonna talk about the resin the head and, and that's what I'd love to see, too. It's just tough. You know, when you're American, you can travel pretty much any way you want. Your your uh, passport's powerful. But we're yeah. not so keen on letting other people into the U.S. to the same degree. So it makes All it right. tough to get them in, you know, easily. And I would love to take them to, like, the Emerald Cup. It'd be great to take them to see some commercial operations and let them see some craft farms and let them, let them puff on some hash that was made in the U S so they can see that type of product too. And yeah. just, just for the cultural exchange yep. and, and, and at the same time to show them the hospitality they, they showed us, I'm sure the people that you were with treated you in a level that's kind of made you feel negligent mm -hmm. in your own hospitality. <laughs> Absolutely. hundred percent, man. And, and that was the thing, like they took pride in being the best host possible. Oh, like they were the point, genuinely bag, concerned. If you didn't need a carry, they made sure wow. they, they made they, it was almost embarrassing because I said, Whoa, it's okay. And they said, No, Kev, you don't understand. It matters to us. Yes. That we know it's all good. It's it's not a show. It's let let us do, do this for you. Let me do it, it makes yeah. us feel better about ourselves because it lets us know we're doing our best. Yep. And it was just so pure, you know, it was good. What what other questions Beautiful. you got, Cal? I know you got a couple on there. Uh, yeah, I think there was one. Uh, like, what's the big best hash that you've had in life, or or in, or just in, like in, when you were in Pakistan? Pakistan. Yeah, oh, yeah what? Mm -hmm. there was a the yeah. I I I there was there was there was two batches I liked best, and both were from Tira. But one of them came from uh, Salamat. Salamat uh, was uh, he's a, a local. And okay. he he procured some nasty as shit was phenomenal. When you opened it up, it filled the room with the smell of like flowers and fruit and shit. It was just absolutely phenomenal. Okay. Yeah. And then the patty that Saeed had. So Saeed comes and hangs out with us. The boys go and grab him in, in Tira Valley and bring him back. And he's hanging with us. And me and him are chilling. And he gives me, tears his patty in half. And he gives me half his patty. And so I flatten it out and I put it in some plastic and I put it in, yeah. in inside my coat so that I can, I don't lose it. Yeah. And we're hanging out and he smokes and it was killer. We were puffing on it, but it was cracking. And a day later he was out of hash. He had, he had smoked all his hash and he was sitting there and he was looking sad. And I laughed because yeah. I knew that his hash was screaming Ooh. and I looked at him and I laughed and I pulled it out of my pocket and I was like, this is yours. And the look in his face was like, oh, you got to be kidding me. And I gave it back to him and he snaps it open and he peels half of it out and gives me half back like that's just keep it. Yeah. But then he was and he was laughing and he was so happy because it's just nice to see people that are hash freaks like you are. So you don't feel like you're a full blown junkie when you're smoking. 
You like, you know what I mean? You can't fake that love. And yeah. and it was, but it was delicious. And so it's not about awe inspiring power. It was more about how did you feel from the effect? Like, what did it do to you? Like, what vibe was created? What was the, yeah. the resonance of the energy? And, mm -hmm. and that's all these hippie terms that I never fucking followed <laughs> when I was young. But the older you get, the more you realize that that's really what yeah. it is, man. You're feeling the energy electrifying your electrons. And you're, you're, you're elevated in this really healthy, clear, cool manner where you weren't ravenously hungry. You yeah. weren't, you weren't like so high that you couldn't hold a conversation. Mm -hmm. You, you, you weren't crashing from the hash that made you like, oh, I got to take another rip before I fall out. I need to reboost. Yeah. None of that shit. It was like it lifted you up and it held you at this really warm, good, solid place where your mind was active, but you were calm and mm -hmm. your body was chill, but you could still move. So, I mean, it was just really super functional, but it, without mm -hmm. question, it changed the resonance of you and how you viewed the world around you. Oh, wow. it, was, it was really a neat experience. Yeah. I, I'm not going to say it's better than American products because- the shit we're producing right now is, a, I don't know if any, yeah. anybody on planet earth has ever made a hash that's as volatile and as flavorful and as absolutely explosively powerful as what's being made now. But does that mean that's better than a good feel? Yeah. And so I think yeah. that the individual has to make the determination. So that's why I say like, no, I don't, because someone's like, would it compare with American hash? And I'm like, well, in some ways it was, it's incomparable. Yeah, because that it gave me a Different high that problem. was absolutely enveloping, but in like a warm blanket with a you know hot cup of tea kind of feel where you just felt comfortable. Yeah, and and, and, and I, yeah, I'm smoking a lot my whole yeah. life, so I'm like I'm really yeah. clear about what I'm looking at when I'm doing it because I'm trying to understand what is it that we want to bring with us into our product lines, and so when you're doing hybridization work with these genes from other countries. It, it's everyone's like, well, the THC number's hot. And I'm like, I really don't care. What I'm seeking is, is the experience hot? And can we capture it? Mm. And how do we capture it? Mm -hmm. And and are we able to take it to where it's given us a different feel than what we're smoking right now? Because we've, we've compressed the gene pool so badly that everything is basically homogenized high. So you know, most of the shit you smoke is similar. Mm -hmm. How much do you think that is contributing to the hash that you're smoking over there in those areas being... Uh, uh, you know, it could be a whole fucking field. Who knows how much resin oh, they're putting so, together. Well, that's the whole point is that it's yeah. not just, it's not whole plant. It's not plant. a single plant. Because people are like whole plant. I'm like, no, brother, it's whole it's crop. Whole field. <laughs> so you're getting a cross section of cannabinoids and metabolites that are phenomenal because they're not just saying, here's the purple. We only make the purple. They make the whole crop. Yep. And that's what tripped me out with the seeds because when I collected the seed, right? I know what they were sifting for 1500 years ago, which was seed, but they did not sift for big seed alone. They sifted for quality of seed and the small seed. I gathered a bag of seed that was the single smallest seed I've ever seen in my life. And when I looked at it with my, like my, I brought my ganja loop with me. I was looping this shit over the field. Oh, fuck yeah. I brought my Dude, all the farmers too. love that. We showed them the loop. Yeah, they got to look this, at their charis. Yes. They were looking at their plants. They were blown away by it. It was awesome. And me too. They were just like, what are you, they were holding it out here. I'm like, no, no, let me show you how to use it. Right. Yeah, so it was great because Derek had given us a really good tutorial on the, on the loop. And mm -hmm. so I was able to copy the tutorial I got from Derek and it, <laughs> it allowed me to let these people play with a toy they don't play with. And, and it was just, it was just epic in that regard, but it's, it's such a consortium of cannabinoids and, and secondary metabolites that you get just a balanced profile and the seed reflected it where it went from brown seed into the most tiger stripe shit you ever saw to seed that wow. were the size of small marbles to seeds that were the size of like i mean microscopic but when you looked at them under the loop completely built wow and so yeah so it was just crazy and i i recorded all that i recorded it all in a journal i journaled yeah. all the stuff i had i got i got it right next to me so I, I journaled it all so I would remember it. And then we have all the collection maps of where everything was collected. And then the soil that was collected, there was a crew that was was tied into land race um, from Iran, uh, uh, Iran Z. 
and he they they hit me up and said, "Hey, we have the 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 passes to get it shipped out of uh, out of that area legally." And then they realized I wasn't in India; I was in Pakistan. <laughs> and so I said, so they said, "Ah, oh, we can't send it," and they were bummed. And I said, "No, no, I think I can get it out. I think like let me just let me just do the thing we do, and we'll we'll get it to the source eventually." <laughs> and so I collected it for them, so this way they can do the essay on it. But it lets me do the essay as well. And the main point is that you're able to share the information so we can take a look and better understand where are these profiles coming from? Because what we're doing is we're crop steering so effectively that we're homogenizing everything. We're doing such a good job with crop steering that we're steering ourselves into cardboard, that we're, we're, we're not creating any stress and the plant isn't creating any of these exotic metabolites to counter it because we're not creating any. So it's ironic that we're creating the best biomass I've ever seen in human history. But at the end of the day, the high is off. Mm, it's man, off. And I'm like, and it's not about, it's, and, I, and it's just, it's like the same thing with, with organics where everybody runs the same profile. It's the same shit. Like there's got to be differentiation and there's got to be differentiation that you take further by selecting plants in your methodology and allowing there to be this development of you, the plant and the methodology simultaneously. Like that shit's differentiation. And that was all yeah. of us prior to the, the legal world, so to speak, because you were in a silo. So you yeah. did your thing and you figured out what works best for you and your method and your plants. And to and me, you were smoking, you were selecting yeah. by smoking, by, by, you by how quality. it made you feel, not, not, you didn't have any COAs. You didn't know what the fuck THC no. level was. You just and you can know, kind of it feel it that way work. by smoking, but yeah, you just were going by good bud and growing more of it. That's it. Yep. And I, I miss those days. And so like with the work I'm doing now on my private stuff, it's purely that. Because when I do work for bigger companies, it's radically different. What I'm doing is I'm, I'm being brought in to help you understand commercial desire. So I can work with science yeah. until they don't, until the, until you don't need me. Because if we're doing our job, we're educating you, right? So if I'm teaching the science team what to look at and how to look at it and why I'm looking at it this way, it lets them now have all the tools they need to not need you, which is fine because I, I, my job, you, you're bringing me in to educate you. My job is to educate you, not hold you at a level that you continuously need me. It's to get it to where you don't need me. That's education. Yeah, but in the process the of it, you get to drive the car. So when you get brought into companies that are big, that have real money, and they're letting you drive the car into terms of like, what are you trying to get done and why and what do you want it to do and how do you want it to be? And then you have brilliant science teams that can execute on that. That's as official as it gets, right? That's like, that's next level shit. That's AI data gathering, right? You're, you're, you're working at an, an extreme. So I work at these extremes, which satisfies any desire I've ever had in my whole life to do it. Because everybody wants to touch the toy at the highest level, right? But once you touch it at the highest level, the problem is it's kind of boring because there's constraints that have to be met. And when you get rid of those and you go back into just experiential weed, there is only one constraint. Is it fucking awesome to smoke? (laughs) And that shit's fun. So I like, I mean, I I do both because one of them is, 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 is your... Is, is, is what you're, is what I'm being brought in for. I'm being brought into, I call it like contract killer. I get brought in to kill problems. So people bring yep. me in to like solve a riddle. And once we solve the riddle, the riddle's solved. But in my own life, I'm not looking for that. It's the opposite. I want it to be so simple that I feel like I'm 23 again. And I'm, I'm, I'm just growing in my house and I'm just thinking the world is just an incredible place. And I'm just really happy that every time I smoke the joint, I'm just loving it. And I, so I'm sometimes I don't even want to leave the house. I just want to stay home and smoke. That there's nothing outside the house better than me chilling with my fish and my weed. <laughs> I want to go back to then, you know, like that, literally that type of relationship with the product. And the only way you can do that is to get rid of every constraint except that one. And it's completely polar opposite to what I do as like uh, a technician and I love it most, you know? And so it, it lets you stay alive emotionally. Otherwise you just be kind of gets, you just kind of turn into a robot when it comes to the industry. It's just always about the same thing, more per square meter, 
this, 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 this. And if you do all that, you're doing great. And it's all good, but it's dry. No passion. No, it's, 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 you gotta, you gotta bring your passion to solve the riddle. So the, what, what I do is I, I bring the desire to solve the riddle and to make it happen. That's what I use to fuel it so that you can really stay on it. But like I said, if you're doing your job and you're educating people, then they don't need you. It's the same thing with me with the Ganjie, where if once you're certified, I have no question that you can assess cannabis correctly or you wouldn't be certified. There's not one person that's that passed that test that I don't think is competent to look at a product and give me an assessment and then be able to explain to me how they got the number. They don't have to prove the number. They have to be able to explain to me how they got it. We should be within mm-hmm. a range, but it's 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 really about your understanding the process more than the, the accuracy. The accuracy comes, the test determines you're within a level, but your refinement comes with how much you touch. You're touching a lot of shit. You're getting better at your job. But the ability for you to say these things matter and why and be able to help somebody understand how to use it. I know that every graduate in the program has that tool, which I love because it it lets me know that we've done our job as educators and we've given you the power to go work independently and you don't have to have me validate you. You don't. No. That's the, that's my whole thing is that I'm 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 there to stand next to you when I'm not there to not there to shine brightly. I'm here to just to be me and, and let the individual. And so when we do that with education, it always takes us out of the picture to a degree. And so you're always having to constantly figure out how do you maintain your, your, your enjoyment of a picture when you're teaching people to replace you in a picture and how do you teach them to replace you in a picture and give them all the tools possible to do so the only way you can do that is if you make sure that you're constantly on an adventure somewhere. So that way you don't fear anybody. Cause I know that like I'm crawling, I'm crawling down the rabbit hole so deep that there's no <laughs> oxygen. You're, you're learning how to hold your breath. You know what I mean? Yeah. That makes it so you can be cool. Otherwise we can't do this. We can't share the info. We can't educate people. You can't train people. So the very thing that you do with with high end institutions and, and and big picture players is you're teaching them how to replace you, but until that takes place, it might take a couple of years. But in that time period, you're getting to drive their Ferrari, and you're driving it, and you're leaving paint all over the street. So <laughs> it, it, it's increasing your skill set radically. It's changing the very world you're in, and it lets you validate the fact that at the end of the day, I really don't give a shit about a COA. What I know is I really like smoking this weed. It makes me happy. And when I smoke it, my day seems to be better than when I don't. <laughs> that's what no. I'm looking for, you know? No, that's what, do you think, what do you think about like maybe next level, Ganjie, the second tier, or something like that? It's like, yeah, like you're saying, we've got all these multi-million dollar turnkey sites that are running, but getting people up into these mountains. Oh, seeing traditional question. cannabis, seeing natural cannabis, seeing how the uh, people critical. live with the plant. I, I agree be, with you. Yeah. It's critical because we're all obsessed with it. Remember, in our whole drug history in America is 100 years old. Maybe yep. maybe 120, yep. like say, let's say, say, say turn of the century herb was, you know, played around with, right? Like 1900 coming up from musicians, jazz groups, uh, Mexicans were consuming it on their own. But we got 120, 130 year history of weed, right? To us, it was never anything other than weed. But when you're in a village and you're asking them, what did you do with this shit? And they go, oh, we ate it. This was our primary food source for the winter. It's what saved our lives. Without weed seed, we'll, we'll freeze to death and die. And, and then we use the cannabis as a medicine to help us with our bodies so we can handle the pain and the ailments of aging. And, I'm not, and you're like, holy shit. You know, it's so real. And, and like for me being in medical cannabis, I learned that applicability. But it was taken out of the American vocabulary. We remove the normality of cannabis to where if you use cannabis in your in your health regime, you're you're uh, an uneducated hippie and you should be going to the doctor. I <laughs> heard and, that one. Oh, everyone yeah. has, you know, everyone has. And and the problem with it is, is that, you know, you go back and see these cultures that have, you know, millennia of usage and it was a medicine and it was a food and it was a fiber. And then they figured out that they could just pull the resin off completely and consume it. And, and that was that was thousand years after they started screwing with it, right? So a thousand years of using the product and they figure out, hey, we can sieve it through a through a, a rug. 
the herb that when we wrapped the rug around the plants and it got shaken on the camel, the shit that collected in the bottom of the container, we didn't know what to do with it. We smoked it and we got fucking hammered. Whoa, we just made hash. And oh, wow. that's the truth. It was all accidental discovery through application. And so oh. when you understand that, it just helps you understand how to better communicate it so that what you're what you're able to do is help people have the ammunition they need to explain it to the public. Because the war on drugs was so effective that it created this, this zealotry of anti-cannabis usage. Because cannabis is the one. Because cannabis is the one. Cannabis is the drug that has the ability to get people to get along. Mm -hmm. And if yeah. there was one drug you wanted to get rid of is that one, because it goes contrary to what we needed, which was racism. Cause we had to go fuck people that weren't white. And it's funny. I'm white, but I'm like, Oh no, we were fucking people that weren't white. So we could steal other shit. And then we needed to make sure that the white hippie who was a uniter of other colors got demonized. We had to get rid of him too. So every time you turn around, it's a, it's this tool used to divide populations and if you look at the war on drugs, it was all based off of the ability to get people to behave in a racist manner where you could go against blacks and go against Mexicans. And then they painted the hippie as this anti-American, you know, war hater and completely against the American people. And the truth was they were the most American of anyone, because at the end of the day, being able to have freedom of choice is what was the, the the foundation of America, where you didn't have to comply and follow a rogue government doing nut shit. And yep. so they they extinguish the hippie, they extinguish the black community, they go after the Mexican, and it becomes a product. If you look at California, the only counties that really have thriving cannabis industries, if we would say by like access, is ones that aren't minority um, populated. I did all the research on it years ago because I was just fascinated by what I was seeing. And so I'm like, the shit never changed. And at the end of the day, we, we need to be able to use cannabis in a way that lets us get around xenophobia, which is, you know, fear of the unknown individual and mm -hmm. realize that the Colombian, because I'm hanging out with Colombian craft farmers, they hella cool. I'm hanging out with Pakistani craft farmers, they hella cool. Yeah. They're, they're, we're all the same. And I think that's what they really didn't want to take place. But the ability to say, hey, if you ate the seed, you'd get an incredible level of omegas. If you yep. use the cannabis as a tea, it would help you with digestive issues and colon colon issues and things that were that are really affecting a tremendous amount of people in the U.S. And then if you want a head lift, you get into it. The big fear is that it makes people self-sufficient. It makes communities self-sufficient. If you can yes. grow enough herb, you can take care of yourself and your family, either by selling it or consuming it or using it for your livestock. And yes, so you, you don't need anybody. You don't need nobody. You don't need a system. You need water, you need sunlight, and you need the herb. That's it. Yeah. And then you, and can, if you, you and if you're totally and if you're letting the animals eat that the the byproduct then their endocannabinoid yep. system is super stimulated and you're able to eat the meat, eat the egg, eat the food yep. that has these components in it. And so what you're noticing is that the Huns is living to a hundred. And as soon as I get off the plane and I'm in the U S I'm like, Holy shit, man, it looks like 85% of the population ready to fall over and die. And yep. I tripped out and I just said, Whoa, what's up? Wilder? <laughs> so the, it, it's just really an interesting thing. And it's so like I said, like I, and I, Oh, you want to say hi? Yes. Come here. Hello. There Hello. Hello. <laughs> nice to meet you. Nice to meet yeah, you. Nice huh? to meet you too. You too, man. Wait, 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 I have a cupcake. Do I have a cupcake? Do you have a cupcake? Oh, Emma wants <laughs> a cupcake too. Y'all want cupcakes? You have a cupcake? <laughs> you want a cupcake? <laughs> oh, oh Emma. Okay, yeah, yeah, yeah I want a cupcake. Uh, okay, hang on. Hold on. Have me some gluten free there, cupcakes. <laughs> yeah, no, I want a good cupcake too. Let me have that right there. Thank you. <laughs> no, so, um, uh, so, so Kev, I, I, I want to ask you, there's something, um, that, that, I that there's been, there's been kind of striking towards me, something like we learned during a ganja training about like the different qualities of hash. And when you were talking like, well, first, like just looking at the videos of just that, just that soft, lovely hash that you had in like Pakistan. Um, and then you mentioned that there was Moroccan hash that was like really tough that had to be shaven. Um, 
the difference between those two is that like is that having more to do with like just like the 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 resin um or how how or how they're choosing to harvest it Oop, oh, hey, we, we lost you there. Uh, we, we can't hear you. I think you muted. There you go. Yep, I muted so yeah. my son's breakdown isn't recorded um, oh. <laughs> to be three. Um, I don't know. I didn't talk to the maker. I just knew that the Pakistani guy I was rolling with it just got back from Morocco and he broke out a big chunk of it. But when I was a kid, so like I started smoking hash probably like 79, 80, right? And the first hashes I got my hands on were like red Moroccans and these pale blonde Lebanese and they were always the Lebanese was softer than the Moroccan, but the Moroccan was hard and it was red. And you kind of like had to use a knife to kind of like slice it off and you couldn't break it with your fingers. And the, the Lebanese was softer, but it wasn't until probably 80, 81 that I got my first, like what we were calling like Afghani black hash. Mm. And that shit was coming in and big in, in, in keys flattened out. It looked like a brownie plate. And you'd go to the dealer's house and they'd cut it with a pizza knife and you'd buy like an ounce of it. And then I'd break it up into, into 28 grams and sell it at school. And, but that hash was soft and malleable and you'd heat it with the lighter and soften it up and fluff it up and put it in your bowl. But right. every time I've ever touched Moroccan hash, it's always been like stone. So that harder hash, like, uh, cause I, I did notice in the videos that you posted with, um, with like the, in Pakistan that oftentimes I saw them, um, lighting, um, the hash, like uh, heating it up with a match or with a lighter or something like that with like with, with the harder hashes being shaved. Is that is is that like is that even necessary or they're just homogenizing it as like more of a like a like a finer powder? Or? I don't know. I have to go there and, and actually talk to the maker I, because I didn't right. talk to the maker. Like I know that typically it's all it's all the same thing. It's all, you know, basically beat and sieved over screen. Oh, yeah. I'm, but, I mean, when they're actually like it, pre prepping it for consumption and whatnot, because like, yeah, I saw no, what were, we did is they we just took it in. You could heat it up, but like it was easier really to take. You could heat it and soften it. But scraping it with something sharp was quicker okay whereas okay. whereas like the where the pakistani hash the you know you take a piece of that and smash it with your hand and it would it look like a like a half dollar and they would just grab it with the edge of a of a of a knife blade or a, a wooden match hit it with the lighter and soften it up and then they take it in their hand and they would just start working it in their hand really quickly and rolling it and working it working it and rolling all of a sudden this beautiful material just unfolded in their fingers and then now they could take it and either mix it with the tobacco or create snakes or, or donuts or whatever method they wanted. But it was interesting because every time I've smoked Moroccan, it's always been a denser form. The flavor is really good. I mean, it's definitely yeah. nothing against Moroccan hash, yeah. but it doesn't in my entire life. Maybe, and I'm not saying that I'm a Moroccan hash expert because I don't think I am by any means. Yeah. It's just that every time I've gotten a hold of Moroccan hash, it's always been a denser material. It has a really cool flavor. I like the flavor that comes off of it, but, and I like the high, but the material is always denser and harder than we would have like in these regions. And a lot of it could just be how the, the metabolites are formed and what plants are selected. And like that, that's the whole thing is that's what needs to be done. And is, is that what you have is you have people that come and take a look at the processes and the, and the, the products, and they do like a scientific essay on it to understand mm. And then you, you lens it through cultural necessity. So what we do is we're always lensing it under this, this uh, what is perfect. But you got to right. realize that you're in regions that don't have electricity. So it's kind of hard for them to put together a freeze dryer. It's hard to get a washing machine up in the top of a mountain. You're, you're, it's yeah. not so easy to carry this shit. Where's your ice machine coming from? Well, you're chipping ice off a fucking glacier for Christ's sakes. Like that's basically what you're doing. Oh, so how do you, how do you standardize some of this in a way that you, it's, it's impossible. So they do it with in the methods that work for them. And the point is that those methods have satisfied a billion people of, cons of consumption since its yeah. inception. So what we would need to do is in my opinion is to look at it from that lens of people seem to really love this. And does it mean that if we improve the way it's made, will they still love it the same? Right, because whenever right. you change a process, you change the product, right? So just yeah. because you've increased or improved something, has it improved the impact to the user? Yeah, and that's something that we were talking about, Ryan, uh, Ryan and I, about like uh, with um, 
they were he was telling me about how the inhibitory protest that they were starting to experiment with um with like bubble washing and that there was still like a lot to be desired in that entire process and practice and we're talking about how maybe it would be beneficial like if someone like a, if like so, like an experienced um like you know bubble hash maker went out there and tried to like show like uh, the people working on it like uh, maybe like how to improve their process but like would it actually bring a greater benefit to the people consuming it um was it, the big it, question it, you can't improve the process though, because the problem is the infrastructure is not there. So the problem that we have in like, we would call say like developed countries. When, when I say developed, I mean infrastructure, right? So I don't mean culturally developed. I don't mean human development. I'm talking, you got freeways electricity. and you got electricity and running water everywhere. Yeah. You know, that's in control. You're in total control that you're, 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 I don't give a shit. And in the United States, there's no place in the U.S. that doesn't have access to power and water at some capacity. And if you can't, you can bring a diesel generator in and create a city like we did in so on for all those years with all the grows yeah. because you have access to fuel. And so the problem is that anything that it was, it was the same issue when we were in like Columbia was an example where you had to go almost seven hours up a river on, on, on boats that were like 12 inches off the, off the water surface to get to the, the, the grow. Wow. And someone was telling me they need to be bringing all this shit. In. And I'm like, no, they can't. What they did is they created a grow the same size as the grow where they grow all the plants that they're going to use as ferments and as top dress. So they're, they're, oh. they're making two gardens. One is their food source for the plants. And the other one is the plants because they can't bring it in. And so someone said to me about, you know, the desert, they said, Hey, what they need is they need drip irrigation. And I laughed and I said, and where the fuck are they going to get drip irrigation in the middle of the desert? And they said they need more water. And I'm like, well, and my genius friends, tell me how you get more water when it's flowing 10 inches a year out of the sky. You got to tap in like, well, you'll drill a well. And I'm like, okay, well, they're digging with a fucking shovel. And everything that is that occurs in these regions is tougher because of the location. Exponential. Yes, yeah. there's no yeah. simple answer to this shit. So what you really want to do is you want to be able to like, I think it'd be better if you brought the hash makers from these regions, cultivators from these regions into the US. And we, we have. Yeah. So, so by the miracle of life, the so I don't have any Pakistanis rolling in, but almost every job I've ever been on, we've had the miracle where they somehow have made it into the US. And lo and behold, most of them have made it to the Emerald Cup. And so what it does, it, no, I'm serious. It lets people see our world in its full glory so that they can understand what is the Western world. And then we can all hang out in the hotel room and smoke and chill and talk. But it helps them lens it from the perspective that works because it's how do you get all this shit over there? How do you travel it? You can bring them all the gear in the world. You break one fucking part. They have over. to get it. Yeah, and so like yeah. even me bringing the slingshots, I brought extra, extra rubber extra bands, bands so that if they broke the band, they'd have it. And they laughed. I said, look, extras. And they were like, great. Yeah, that's the stuff it, you don't it, really it, think it, about. It's as simple as this, right? So say you get them a five-gallon washer and they've got five-gallon bubble, bubble bags. If they're in a culture or a village or a location where alcohol is not permitted, how are they going to clean those bubble bags? You can't. You can't. You can't, and there's the no alcohol permitted. The molecule permitted. itself is yeah. not even allowed because That's, of religious or spiritual beliefs. Oh my beliefs. gosh, I didn't even consider and that. Even, and not even like no alcohol, like, well, not in Virginia, ISO, not nothing. They, in Virginia, they 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 they, do, they have um, they made uh, they they criminalized, I guess, like. Um, Everclear that's above a certain proof. So I got to go up to Maryland whenever I want to get foolproof Everclear. And yeah. uh, but they make exceptions through the ABC in Virginia that if you have like an, an industrial reason or whatever, whatever, you can get it. But like in a country where alcohol is not permitted, period. Like, right. like, yeah. like, yeah. What, what do you I even? Mean, what do you even do? That's why with the dry sieving, they they have things that are that can be tossed. You have fabric. You have something that can be remade. It's regenerative. <sighs> It, it is, is. It and they use the static tech to keep recreated. the waste out. Yeah. Static yeah, from the, the metal. The static. That the was why it's that. Static why these They're moving it through, but the metal preserved. creates static. Yeah, that's why these things have to be preserved. We don't need to teach them new things. We have to preserve what they know, because otherwise it's going to be lost, and it's all going to be globalized as the same thing. And everybody's going to be making 
you know, and, and, and it's still different. Everybody's going to make their traditional products, but, but to really highlight it and show it to people that give a shit to travel to the regions, to go on these expeditions and then highlight it while you're there. Look at how the fields grow. Look at how the people handle the plant. That's what will preserve that culture. Totally. You're not, no, it's not what's better or what's not better. And that's what I, when I got there, I was like, you know, what do you, what do you need me to do to help you? Like, what's the thing? And they said, we just need you to be able to shine a light on it and, and, and enjoy your time here with us. And that's really our goal is to let you have a good time and let you meet a lot of diverse people so that you get to really see the picture and you get to work with us on a collection because we would like your company on a collection. Like we would like to work with you on this project. And, and I'm not getting any financial compensation out of it. It's not, we're not in business together. It's not about that. They yeah, wanted to be yeah. friends and they just said, Hey, yeah. you are somebody we followed for a while. Would you be willing to take a risk and come spend a couple of weeks with us? And we would really like to see it. And it was good because like, you know, for me, I'm, I, I call myself content because I'm not really a producer. So I'm in as much content as anybody I've ever met in cannabis, but I don't really generate it. I'm, I'm, I just show up and I just do the thing. Right. But it was great because Danny, Danny's got a, you know, a, a like a, call it a media company. And he was able to, to really put a shitload of good content together. And we had professional photographers with us, filmmakers, uh, uh, John and Ralph. And we had Arslan, who was the uh, Pakistani photographer who was talented, right? So this, this, this young kid was talented. So the amount of material we had in total was there. And what we were able to do was work as collaborators on each other's reels so we could all share and move the material around easily. And it allowed us to take, you know, 20 people, which was the total number of people in the five rigs and take 20 people and push 20 people worth of content out and link it all together so that everybody got to see this just cornucopia of views, but nonstop every day, something happening. And I just think he did a really good job. And so he, he really kind of pushed that shit into a situation that allowed all of us to be able to support. So like my reach is big, but like I said, I'm not, I'm not a content whiz. I'm not someone that's on IG every day shooting content. I think I got like 300 posts, right? My entire life. So that's not what I'm about. It's just that I want to get the information to people so they can check it out. And because the reach is good, it allows me to be able to take his work and push it out, which then brings attention back to him, which brings attention back to the Pakistanis. And then now all of a sudden people are starting to cross pollinate and follow everyone in the group. And that was really the idea was that we really wanted to, to say thank you for taking the trouble and the time and the effort and the money to fly us all the way out and, and take care of us. Like we were like your kids. It was trippy, man. I felt like I was like a little kid at my uncle's house or something. And, he was going to take you out for ice cream and pizza and then burn a joint with you when no one was looking. <laughs> it was, it was, it was kind of like that, you know, there was that level of just cool and everything taken care of. No, yes, worries. no, no worries. just unbelievably conscientious. And that's something that you can't fake. And then people were like, well, you know, there's, there's refugee problems there. And I said, I know there is, but yeah. I'm American. We got problems here. I said, it, there's problems everywhere. And I can't, I'm not there in the country to solve all your riddles. I can barely solve my own riddles in my house. So what I can do though, is be decent when I'm in your house and I can be cool when I leave your house. And if we can do that, then that's a beginning. And that lets us at least have the groundwork for a future relationship of, of reciprocity that's reasonable. So as we go forward, what we're doing is we're fighting to keep our culture alive in the U S because don't tell me our culture isn't getting stomped the fuck out. And so the craft culture in America is basically under tirade and war continuously, because how do you exist in a world where if you can't get a license? You can't be real. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so right. They're, they're, they're making it really difficult. They're making it to where it's too risky and it's, and everyone's like, yeah, but you just brave it. And I'm like, yeah, but when we used to brave it, we could afford lawyers. You can't afford lawyers anymore. You don't make enough money trapping to afford good legal help. And so the difference was that I had a lawyer on retainer for 25 years. So like I could be bold, 
because I could pay for lawyers. So having having a team of lawyers is like having Mike Tyson in a bar fight. Like it 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 absolutely changes the outcome. <laughs> and when you yeah. can't when you can't afford lawyers, you basically a victim and it's that's what's making it hard. And so you have all these limits and all these restrictions. So nobody can do anything other than bare minimum. And what it does, it it makes it to where little little by little there's less and less of the craft people. And then eventually what you just have is full size business and you just go buy your shit at at, at Costco. You go buy your Kirkland brand weed. And and I'm sure it'll be probably pretty good. Like most of this commercial weed is. It's pretty good. I'm not saying it's a fucking D. It's just not an A. It's visually an A. Shit's shining like a like a spotlight. But man, you smoke it and you kind of leave. And I and yeah. and, it, and it's I'm not talking like and I'm not talking either biological chemical form. It doesn't make a difference. It's I, I see smoking weed in, in all forms of cultivation. It's just really about your your desire of what are you there for. And if you're there to choose the best product and the methodology you use, and your job is to release the best product possible, that shit is craft owned. Yeah. Commercial facilities be, can't, mm-hmm. they can't fucking do it because they can't because their concern is making money first, which I which I'm not against. But let's call it what it is. That's yep. the separation between commercial and craft. It's not about size. I know cats that are commercial at one light, and I know dudes with 200 lights that are craft. It's about the intent. What are you trying to do? What is your primary objective first? And if first is quality, yeah. your craft. If it's profit, your commercial. Craft is second. It's that subtle. We're talking one or two points difference maybe on some of the better operators. But fucking two points is two points. <laughs> yeah, you can definitely you can definitely one percent something to a to an entirely different like uh, zone. You, it just grabs yeah. you different, and you just like at the end of the day, I'd rather pay. I enjoy it so much, I'd pay more for it because when I smoke it, I smoke half as much. Really good herb, you do not smoke mm-hmm. as much of Absolutely. because at the end of the day, yeah. you're, you're sated better, your satiety level is higher, and it lasts longer. If if yep. it's just one of the that's what I just noticed. A better herb, you smoke less. Absolutely. Oh yeah, yeah, no, and definitely, definitely will last a lot longer. Yeah, you know, say, so, um, so I've got, I've got a, a couple, I've got a couple of questions. Yeah. Um, though I asked, but like, a, but before we start, um, wrapping, um, some stuff up. One, um, I say, I, I comes from a, uh, uh, one of the, uh, I guess, um, supporters of our podcast here, a good friend, uh, Ben Romine. I'm also the owner of Room to Grow VA. He hooked me up with some, uh, uh, with, with some hash um, for for this for this little podcast. Um, uh, so definitely shout out to him. He has some, was it single source uh, blueberry daydream um, that was like fresh frozen and hand pressed. Uh, and uh, like it, it smells so nice. Uh, we, we were smoking some of it the other day and I was just like, dude, I've definitely got to have some of this for the podcast. Um, and uh, he like his question, um, uh, which was uh, for the uh, for some of that fire hash um, that that you that you were um, uh, token on with, with the the friend that like ended up like like ended up splitting uh, splitting up that patty and whatnot yeah. um, was was that like similar to like uh, in your opinion that uh, similar to these uh, to the other runs of hashes where it was like a whole crop or could this have been like one like more of like an isolated like crop no or no no type situation? whole crop whole crop just first pass. First, okay, first whole pass, crop at yeah, the first you're, pass. You're, 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 you're light with your hands. It's kind of like we used to call it the bounce. Back when silk screening was popular like 20 years ago, before really water process took off, right? It was all silk screen work. And I had friends that we were calling them like, like you know, silk screen masters because they had the soft hand. They knew how to bounce it off the screen correctly to where what they collected was, I used to call it like long grain resin because this it, 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 the shit just Ooh. stuck together different. And I think that the flavor of dry sift is phenomenal. Done right, man. The first pass dry sift is absolutely screaming. And so that's what you got from the makers. So when you hung out with the maker, just like us, when you're hanging out with growers, (laughs) you're breaking out the buds. No, I don't want the tops. I want the ones about a foot below the top. They're they're the size of small pine cones because they they get better sun and they're equal and the colors are even. So the whole bag looks identical. That's that's grower shit where you're like, no, no, I got the better shit right here. That's what they had. Everybody, they said, no, no, okay. this was sent over from them. We went and got this for you. And this is the right shit. And it just, and then when I talked to Saeed, I said, what's the significance? 
And, and it, he didn't speak any English. It was, this was through a, a translator, right? One of the guys I was rolling with, I think he knew me was translating. And he was just right. like, oh, first pass, first touch. And I said, I got, I started laughing because the similarities between us is so shocking. <laughs> it it right. doesn't make a difference. Whoever's touching the drugs, you got the best shit. And then that's what you're holding yourself. And he was sad when he ran out. I'll never forget that. The look in his face. And I looked at him and I said, what's wrong? And he said, this friend's, oh man, I'm out of hash. And I don't think he realized that we had, you know, still 200 grams downstairs. <laughs> but I, I laughed, but I had half his patty still in my pocket. So when I gave oh. it to him, he was like a little kid. He's like 35. And he was glowing. He was so happy. He was making his hash joints and shit. And he, oh, he was, he was just loving it. No, I, I, I love that. I like it. And, and it's like, it's, it's those things like that where when we start to like see the nuances between our culture, that like there's a difference between like the things that we try to like segregate ourselves with and say that makes us different. Like yeah. those mm -hmm. things, let those things pass aside to see what really makes us similar. Like how, like we, we are, we are all people. Oh, like, no <laughs> question. That's the part of when you travel, that's the thing that you need to be able to do is just realize that however difficult the trip is you're gonna go home you're gonna go home yeah. right so like if the bed isn't as soft as yours you're not gonna die if there's no air conditioning in the building it's gonna be okay you're gonna live you're gonna go home you're gonna be all right it, whatever it is not there you'll get when you go back and so what you got to do is you just got to wipe that shit right out of the picture and then start to go what is it that is here what is different? So, you know, when we were in Jamaica on that last project, the guys I brought out, I don't think they realized like just how hardcore we were going to go. Right. And they were like, <laughs> whoa, we're not in, we're not in really nice leather lined uh, AC whips and we're not going to a, 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 like a villa. I said, oh no, baby, we're going to the farm boys. Okay. And I felt hella bad because I realized that like me living in the hills, the Humboldt kind of hillbilly me out. And the boys were hella cool, but the look on their face initially was like, whoa, like this isn't what we signed up for. But as soon as we got to the farm and they saw the product, the farm it sucked them in. It sucked them oh, in. And then, yeah. and, and I felt hella bad too, because it helped me understand, hey, you need to make sure you're clear with people about what the trip is going to be. Because I'm somebody that's fine sleeping in a mosquito net in the jungle. Right? So I'm not worried about it because I just know that we're going to experience some shit that you can't experience any other way, but that way. Yeah. And that's what I'm seeking. And I don't mind any of the difficulties because I know that I'm going to go home at some point and no difficulty is that damn bad. Nah. Like you, you, you're going to eat it just, and you have to learn how to eat different flavors. You got to learn how to eat different food. Oh, that's and the you got to let the, you got to let the locals take you into their world. And you just got to trust them. You got to trust that they're not there to hurt you. And that if there's anything they don't think you should eat, then you, they just tell you. They say, wait a second, you shouldn't drink the water here because your body hasn't had enough chance to acclimate to it. So, like, watch out for this and watch yeah. out for that. Everything else is fine. That's what's And, and so what it does, it just allows you to stay healthy and good. And, and if you were there in the region for a couple months, you'd acclimate to everything and you'd have a microbiome that would work in any condition. Heck, but yeah. it's just about being able to let them guide you and just allow their life to be your life while you're there so that you really just get to enjoy them. Because if you're looking at it critically, people feel that shit. Yeah. And if you're not being cool, they feel that we all do. We pick that shit up quick. And so the problem is, is it changes their comfort level and it doesn't allow the people to really be able to enjoy the process of giving. So yeah. they're not there to be your fucking servant. Their culture in this case was to be of service, but mm -hmm. not to be a slave. And when you are acting like an asshole, that can't work. And yeah, so I was stoked. That the, yeah. And the group I was with was sweethearts. Everybody that I was with, I could travel a thousand miles with again. So, like, I mean, it was just one of those unique times where everybody that was there was there for the adventure. And they all understood that goodwill was the mission and that we were trying to learn how to appreciate a different culture and hopefully bring some value back to spread out. Not that my presence is going to change Pakistan. It's that maybe I can get one person to want to go visit 
I can get one person to want to be involved in the genes. I can get one person to say, hey, I'm going to have a different opinion on this group because they're being portrayed as absolute lunatics. And that's not true. So, yes, I'm sure there's some lunatics in the culture. I'm American. I'm like, I always tell people the same thing. I'm like, listen, you can't, you wait a minute. You can't, you can't. Um, yeah, we're not all the same. <laughs> no, no, we're, 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 we're a bunch of fucking nuts too. Yeah. And so that, that, does that mean that I'm anti-American? No, I'm hundred percent American. I love America. This is my country. This is where I was yeah. born and raised. This is my heritage. So yeah. I'm trying to be a good American by going on trips and traveling and working with people and not bringing a bias yeah. And then what it does, it lets them ask, is this similar to where, what, like, what's the differences, Kev? What's the differences between us and you? And you start to break it down. You go, this is where we got you. And this is where we don't. And this is where we're equal. And then it lets them realize, okay, in the things that are positive, they can work towards. And just like for us, what's the things that we can work towards? Being kinder to guests, being kinder oh. to strangers. And I, and I try that right now. Like I've been, I've been, trying to be good to strangers for a long time because at the end of the day what i want is a better life for me so it's not even like total altruism where it's so positive for everyone it's just that in my life if i'm good then maybe i get to meet people that are similar and maybe those people remain in my life and that's what my life is filled with is good fucking people and the strategy i've had since a kid i mean i've been doing this since i was a boy it's been a good strategy. It's let me meet an absolute phenomenal number of beautiful people around the world that let me know that it's possible to live your life if you desire it. Yeah. You know, so so to see it as a cultural thing, though, not just as a personal desire. And I mean, I came up in a fucking brutal background. So my background made me want a better life. And not everyone who had that background had the same desire. And many people who didn't have the background don't understand the significance of having people in your life. So we, we don't need people because we have money. We have technology. Once you, once you get rid of those things, you need people again. And I think that that's what we really need to learn from it is that with all the technology we have and all the shit we got at the end of the day, Technology doesn't move your refrigerator. Your neighbor no. helps you move your refrigerator. No, no, that 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 is that 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 is some absolute like facts right there. This tech can certainly can certainly not do that. Certainly not do that. Um, no. Uh, so, okay. So, um, and, and spe- speaking of like the the just the, the sharing of knowledge, right? Um. I am like I watched I watched so many of the videos like looking at like like hash preparation and watching like how they were like just like very masterfully like that like that cigarette that like they made like with mm-hmm. uh, with melting the hash and just doing the thing I was like man that is so cool like I I want I want to be able to try and do that like so that if I were to go to Pakistan um or or even be with like a like session with somebody that was from Pakistan I could like do a couple things and like you know like show like hey you know like I, I, I like, yeah, like I'm, I'm down, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm down but with the culture. They show you how though too. <laughs> they're fr- like, they're, they're not, they're not, they're not restrictive of the technology. Like that's the thing is that we're the freaks with the. Prefer- I know people that make you want to sign an ND to go walk on the farm and shit, right? Yeah, and I always I've, laugh I've because that. I'm like, what fucking special shit are you doing that no one else is? Like, I mean, what are you splitting atoms with a spoon? Yeah. You're, you're, you're just let's be real here, right? There's no secrets to this shit. I mean, at the end of the day, it's not the plastic industry. Plastic industry is where that one molecule difference makes the difference between wealth and no wealth. We're not in the plastics industry. We're in fucking ag. And because of that, there's really no secret. And so it's refreshing to see. I've been sharing information my whole career. Like I made, I made information a pipeline into people's lives. So I can say, listen, it does. It shouldn't die with me. I was in a room. We did some really killer shit. I think you should know this so that you can do this shit. Because what it does is it allows people to be able to go further than you. We all have yes. a fucking shelf life. When it's done, it's done, right? But the idea is to get as many people moving forward quickly as possible. And that is a really positive legacy. You're sharing the information. You're creating the ladder up. You're getting people to rise up. Because you're just saying, hey, this is shit we're doing that seems to work. 
and it's effective. And I'm just letting you know. And if you want to use it, you can. If you don't, you don't have to. But I'm not saying anything other than it fucking works. Heck yeah. That's I the beauty of being in these situations is that we are way more guarded than any of the other people I work with in our craft. We hold this shit like it's a secret. Like no one's ever, no one's ever used a dripper before. Like I have a proprietary dripper technology. And I'm like, oh, fucking interesting. You use two. Oh, woohoo. Yeah. <laughs> use two proprietary. It's fucking changing the fucking game. I'm like, okay. Yeah, okay, it, I got you. <laughs> you yeah, know what I'm saying? <laughs> that, that is, oh, I, I know definitely what you mean. I've, I've had to, I mean, granted this, like, I haven't been to some of the places that all of you guys have, like, have, have been at different times. But I've, I've been on farms where I had to sign some stuff being like, I'm not going to, I'm not going to talk about this. And I'm like, oh, okay. I wasn't going to. But uh, yes, okay. and I understand <laughs> the Andes. I understand them when you're in technology. Like you're in technology. Like if you come up with a formulation for the auger for striking tissue culture, right? And it took you 18 months to figure out that base formulation, and that shit basically handles 95% of every plant touching it. Oh, that shit's proprietary. That's 18 fucking months of paying PhD team to figure it out. Oh, that shit wasn't easy. So yeah. I fully understand the need for this. But when we're talking about simple stuff, everything should be moved easily. So if you if you practice the technique, it's just really you can do it with weed though. See, I, I don't think are you cigarette smoker? Um I I I do not traditionally. Um, although I did pick up this pack of organic um, um natural American spirits so so that I so I could make a uh a, a hash, a hash spliff or a hash cigarette. Totally, um, totally. Do the like, donut on the end, right? Make it, you know, so you're rolling well, the hash into a, into a string and you're wrapping it on the end. And as the heat hits it, it starts to melt. And all you got to do is just keep it facing up so it doesn't drip. And it, it literally burns at the pace of the, 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 the joint. So, okay. Well, so here, here's the thing here. Let me, let me see if I can switch this real quick. Pop. There we go. Um, so this, uh, so, so this hash I have here, um, uh, it, it is, I'm, I think this would be more along the lines of what you were talking about would be like, like Moroccan style. Um, I was trying, I was trying to work some out while we were, uh, while we were talking earlier and uh, rather than get more of a, uh, like a like a softer kind of putty i got more of this like um this more like powdery like granular yep. granted it feels that, very soft it feels totally, nice totally totally but... but you would take that ennis and you would take that product right there you would empty out your cigarette so you just okay, empty the okay. cigarette out and then now you take that product and what you're going to do is you're going to have to figure out how much tobacco to hash is the ratio so it burns correctly so but i would like say how... like 50 50. So they were, so they were, and that was something I was really curious about. Like, how were they deciding, like, how much, like, how much tobacco versus, um, ver versus hash that they were, that they were doing? Cause, like, a, it was the person's preference, man. Yes. And, because it isn't, the wouldn't there be would... a point where there's too much? Well, yeah, too much oh, hash won't sure. burn. Yeah. So it's got to be burnability. And so, depending on who you were, so like some of the guys that were hanging out were, lighter hash smokers and they would ask the person spinning up the cigarette they'd say hey could you make me a a, a gentle one and it would be like you know 20 percent hash 80 percent tobacco and then a stronger one would be like 40 percent hash 60 percent tobacco okay but they would like typically keep it to like like a like not not much else like not much beyond the 50 percent hash part though like yeah maybe, yeah like the tobacco and the, because they can burn another one but they, they don't want to have to fight it. They want it to burn well. And the right. way they mixed it and the way they scooped it and tapped it, one guy was inhaling it through the filter, right? He had the filter in his mouth. He makes the matrix in his hand and he's pulling through the joint, sucking the matrix into the fucking Ooh. tube. That shit was G. I looked at him and I laughed and I said, like, what was that? 10,000 fucking cigarettes you smoked to do that? Like the speed that these guys were doing this shit. It's kind of like, when when I was I'm in my rig and I'm driving with somebody and I break up a joint and I roll the fucking thing while I'm driving. So I'm going down the freeway, driving with my knees, rolling a joint, talking to him. And like and so, you know, and, and there are people are like, what the fuck are you doing? And you're like, oh, no, it's OK. And they're like, oh, obviously, that's not the first time you've done this. And it, it's just because, you know, you're consuming the way you consume and you know it. 
And so the thing is, it's that you have the ability to mess around. And what you do is you just play around with your levels and you see what you like. And now what you can do is you can take that hard hash that you use, you can put it inside, and then you can take the stuff that's soft and you can make a little, a little snake donut that you put around the top or you wrap it all the way around. And I, I was playing around with that shit, man. I was playing around with the rap technique and, I was, I was like, once I, once I saw it, I said, oh, I'm going to play. Cause we used to do all this shit with Keith. I used to batter joints with Keith and always, I mean, we've been fucking with hash forever. It's just interesting to see how they do it because yeah. that that's their thing. They call it the snake and the little, the little, the little sculptures of hash. There's a little hash fucking sculpture sitting there where they bend it and move it. And it's just a familiarity with the product that lets you know that they've been touching it since they were children. And their grandfather touched it since he was a child. And it just makes you, it just makes you feel more complete in your craft. Because for me, what I wanted to understand was the region that produced the weed that I built my whole life off of, which is primarily broadleaf weed. And so like I, I, I started off smoking Colombians and Mexicans, but that shit ended pretty quick. Once you get into the early eighties, that game was over. It was, it was indoor now. It was the drug war. It was short cycle stature cannabis. And so I spent, you know, decades in that game. And the the world that we live in, the one that my whole life was built off of, I've had this dream since I was young that I was going to go to all the nasty cannabis producing regions on earth and go fuck around with the locals and just enjoy the smoke and and see what built the the varieties. And because I know that the varieties are built by the people in the place. The place says what can happen and the people choose what they like from that population. And I wanted to understand what was the root of my world. And over the course of my career, I've been to most of the places I wanted to go to. And I, I didn't get to go there. I got to go fucking work there. Like I get to go play <laughs> in the toy box. And yeah, it just right. helps me better understand who I am because I spent well, my whole life in her. Every single place, you probably found a connection back to the culture that you've, you've adopted as your own. You're like, this is exactly. but you found a connection there some way, somehow it's like, holy fuck. Okay. I get it. It now. fills in the blanks. And because yeah. I don't, yeah. Cause in the U S like, especially if you're well known, right. You're well known and you become like this omnip omnipotent individual in herb where like, everyone's like, well, you fucking know weed, but you're <laughs> like kind of, but not really because the more I go down the rabbit hole, the more I understand there is no bottom. And what I'm trying to do is really enjoy the process of discovery. I, I'm not really trying to discover the bottom. I, I know that I won't reach it. But what I want to be able to do is enjoy the hunt and maybe get people to go with me on the hunt and enjoy the, the process. And, and maybe we can have an ability to that like minded individuals can connect through this through this this product we call weed. And so far, it's been really good. But to go to, you know, to go to Pakistan and, and, and see, you know, the hash culture and then see the culture and understand the difficulties and understand like we, we I, I knew like I, I had all my th when I laid out all my theories in herb, I understood that all these regions had these impacts. So it was clear for me to be able to say this is why my patterns work. But I had to go to the places to really cement that shit in. And once you see it, you're like, whoa, I got you. This stuff was artisanal. When, when you're talking to Milana cream and it takes you 10 hours to make 10 grams, you're like, wait a minute. That shit was only reserved for the fucking finest, the guests. That stuff was for the elite. It was not yeah. casual. It was no, a religion. It's an religion. art form. Yeah. 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 It's not anywhere. It's not ubiquitous. And it's just like you see and you see it and it's very class specific too like you were saying it was either for high end guests or or very well off to do people that understood yes. the process and could take the time to do it and they weren't worried about money and working so hard they they refined it because they had the 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 excess i guess totally um, they they had enough to do and it and it fit their it fit their religion religious biases and it fit, it it fit their cultural biases and yep. it just worked and then we take yep. all of it and we swirl it in the U.S. and we create our culture. But our culture is so broken because the drug war wreaks so much havoc and it created its own micro cultures within it, but not a collective culture where we all have common understanding, where no villager I talked to didn't have the same exact. Like I'm talking they have the same exact thing. Oh, yeah, it's been there for 1500 years. 
We've been sifting it for a while. We do the whole crap. We share the seeds. We eat the seeds. We drink the we drink the tea. Um, any different? No. <laughs> everyone's story was identical. It was woven through like this golden thread through everyone's life, and it just let me go. Wow. When we get to that level in the U.S., you'll have a far better ability for individuals to find their their place. The people, because you'll you'll be less judgmental. That's the part of it that the the judgment on it is reduced so dramatically because it's woven into their lives, and that's really what the drug war was was judgment. It was to say that the people who consume cannabis are faulty and they're uh, they're dangerous and they're they're malevolent. And mm -hmm. the, the truth of it was is that you know most people smoking weed for the most part ninety percent of them are, are pretty cool. And the ability for us to see other cultures and how they get along is the key part. It's not about their production methodologies. It's about appreciate what they've done with the little tools they have and yeah. understand that the weed you smoke came from there, came from Colombia. Like you didn't, it, it, there's nothing native in, in North America. We don't have any native herb. So we didn't invent shit. We're really, really the last on the food chain. We're the last ones to get weed. And, and because of that, we have the least amount of real understanding of how to weave it into our culture and our life. So for me, it's just neat to be able to see how it's been done. And, and at the end of the day, you just go back to being who you are and try to be cool and take some of that flavor with you. And I get all the recipes being shipped out for the food. And they're going to get me the list of the spices I got to go buy from the Asian um, store. Heck yeah. So I can start cooking up some of these curries and stuff because the fucking things were good. I and came back with a kg of masala. <laughs> no, you see, yeah, you Are you serious? Oh, that's yeah, awesome. Yeah. I got a big block of shilajit. Yeah. Shi oh, that's amazing. Yeah, yeah. No, we were in Delhi at the spice market. This this old guy just had like 15, 20 different spices all in different containers. And he had a old school brass counterweight scale. And he was just blending it all up at one time. And then he had a little spice grinder. And hey, man, make me up a kg of your uh, your masala. Bam, I got it. Heck, it was four It's incredible. No, no, I got a beautiful blanket too. I'm thinking about seeing, I'm seeing the blanket behind me. And I'm like, I got a beauty one too. There's nothing oh, like yeah. wearing a blanket. Yeah, there's nothing no. like wearing a blanket when it's cold, man. They they got that shit down. They they yes. got the they they got the way to keep yourself warm and cool and like they the got wool. it down. Yeah, the wool, quality man, of the, the wool. wool. I mean, this the high, wind won't wool. go through it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Beautiful. Works so good up there. Totally, totally. Yeah, wow. no, it's it was a gift, and I really hope that uh, the people that get to watch, um, it doesn't matter if they go to Pakistan. What matters is that they leave their home and they go to other lands and and experience it in a way with, without like heavy judgment. Yeah, just go just in, let the people, let the people, yeah, let the people be themselves, and you really get to see some beauty. And it lets you appreciate the beauty that you have here at home. It, it's not a, it's not one's better than another. Nope. It really isn't. It's just, it's just that there's, we're all human beings on the same planet and to get to see the, the cultures connected through cannabis is absolutely, uh, it's a gift, man. It's been a really good gift. Yeah. Now, very, cool. very, very awesome. Now, and, uh, I, I just finished this, uh, the, the cigarette, um, nice. I, I, I think, um, I like, so, but the, this is like, that would like so this would represent pretty much one of the most basic ways that like uh that, that a person in pakistan would be consuming their house 100 percent right? you 100 um, percent way more inside the cigarette than on the exterior only the hash makers played like the guys that were like really like weed freaks like us they're the ones that fucking were decorating the joints with the goodies right but mostly and it was just because it was already loaded inside too but it was just look at the level we can go yeah, but ninety fucking percent of people then they're smoking ash, they're smoking ash in a cigarette just like that. Okay, okay. Now I now I'm the, the one I'm smoking curiosity. some ash too, but it's not from Pakistan. It's some it's some hash I made two years ago that I aged. Nice, very nice. Wow. I so like so one of the things because you're saying like the hash makers that are playing with the hash and are doing that stuff like uh -huh. they they're like that that's something that's also like unique to the fact that they have a softer hash because like this type of like. Uh, Moroccan style hash. You can't do like, that shit. Yeah, you like can't do that with that type. Not, not possible. Right. Um, yeah, the really possible so, so this is going to dictate how you consume it, for sure. 
No, that and that's and that's one of those things that I, I like. Uh, like why why we're even doing this here to take that into consideration? Because I'm sitting here like, yeah, I'm gonna get some hash. We're gonna do some Pakistani style consumption. I'm gonna learn how to do it like just like how they do in Pakistan. It goes like, er, actually, <laughs> like your hash is of a different um, textural quality. Um, but it's okay then, though. You're using the tool, you're using the consumption tool. And the main no. thing is what you're what you're checking out is the combination of the two. And like I said, I'm not a tobacco smoker. I smoked tobacco when I was young. No. And and then I'll I'll fuck with the blunt once in a while if someone's got a blunt. But otherwise, tobacco just kind of um, I, I like herb more. But I wanted to consume. So anytime anybody came up that we were hanging with that brought hash and broke hash out and went to go pre- prepare it and produce it, and they offered it to me, I'd hit it with them. Because what I was really trying to and it was all killer hash. Everybody you're playing with is a pro. And it was, and they were sharing their product with you saying, Hey, would you like to try it? And so I took a couple puffs on it and be able to experience it and then, and then play with the roll and, and watch the snake burn and roll it around and play. And wow. it was just really, um, neat combination. And then for me, I just then would roll my own weed and then do the same thing, put herb in the joint, wrap the joint with the snake, because that way I get the herb that I want and, and I get the hash with it. And so they were tripping out too because they were like, whoa, they'd never seen anybody roll. And then none of the dudes on the trip are used to rolling really fucking full-size joints, right? So like, you know, you're rolling cylinders <laughs> and people are just like, what the fuck is that? And then you got like, full hash too and it's wrapped in hash and you're like, oh, this is going to last an hour. <laughs> you just you just going off and then you just set it down and it's a nice experience. And so what we're really doing is we're just celebrating the culture of cannabis, and so, you know, we got, we're, we're all, we're all U.S., but you were just in India and I was just in Pakistan and we were, we were spending time with people who were traditionalists. And what it, what it did was it just allowed you to go and enjoy a really magic time with some really lovely people. And you come home and you're like, man, I'm, I'm grateful to be home. I love my family and my house and my life, the world around me, my dog. There was moments there where like, if I'd had my family with me, I could have lived there. I could have lived in the Hunza. Wow. <laughs> like it scared me, bro. It scared me. I, I realized I was so happy in the mountains of Pakistan. Cause I'm just like, this is like time stands still. Yeah. You're farming and you're chilling. And that's what you do. And I said, man, I said, if I retired here, it'd be great. Because you, 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 and all you, and, and for the four months that you went through the most brutal winter, I would just be, I wouldn't be there. I would say, wait a second, I'll just come down out of the mountain for four months and stay in Lahore. <laughs> and then for the other eight months of the year, I'll live in the Hunza. And then I'm sure there'd be one year where I'd have to spend the winter just to, to see what it was like. But you know damn well when it's zero night and day, that shit gets old quick. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I get real <laughs> hard on. At that point, yeah. at that point, it's like cold, it's just baby. A tough survive. You cold, you cold, man. Yeah. And I'm like, it's all good. I don't need to prove that to myself. The idea that, I, yeah, the idea that it's possible, I know it's possible. But to, yeah. to have to experience it on, you know, over time is rough. But to be able to spend eight months of the year in the Hunza Valley from spring to fall and eat the food and, and, and just live a simple life, it was crazy it made you, it made you understand really like, whoa, we become so technologically dependent that we don't know how to entertain ourselves without the toy. You, you yeah. forget how to, you forget how to really communicate. You forget how to tell stories. You forget how to enjoy each other's company because you have a device in front of you that lets you talk to a billion people. So you can always find somebody better. No, like there's always no, an improvement right. you can find on the net. And so it automatically always makes everything you're doing not as valid. And so everybody had a cell phone. It was, it was nothing but service. It blew my mind. We had great service all through the Himalayas. It's me just too. that, it, yeah, it killed me. I was like, wow, amazing service. But the people still face-to-face dealings. Yep. And no, it was really, yeah, it was really cool. Time. Yeah, it made, it made me maybe kind of miss it. That we, like, we have it in, in Humboldt. A bunch of us still communicate. But like when I go to the city and I walk up to a stranger to ask them a question or something, and they jump back like I'm going to beg money off of them. It's it's weird. It I don't care where I go. It's the same response. I, mean, I always look at myself in the mirror real quick. Like I look in a window and go, whoa, well, that fucking ugly. And <laughs> it's just like, whoa, because it's so cold shouldered. And, and you got your phone in your hand. You're obviously looking for something and you can't find it. And you're like, hey, is this street the one we're on? 
if you were doing that in Pakistan, they would stop and say, oh, hang on. We'll walk you to the street corner. Yep. They literally I walk into the and it would be an old, two old men, two old men with beards would be like, oh, hang on. What do you need us to do? We will walk you. And 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 as you're walking, they're having a conversation with you. They're actually talking to you. It was so odd because we've become so aggressive in our stay away from me. I need six foot of personal space. Don't get too close to me. We've become really, really separated and segregated. And everyone's like, look how many friends I got online. And I'm like, fucking post that you need someone to go clean your fucking house and tell me how many of them come by. Yeah, yeah. Like, let's be really clear here. Like, tell, like, post that you need help doing labor and it's hot. Tell me how many of these fucking friends come by, right? Because if you get three come by, you're a winner in life. You get a couple people that are willing to come by and do some hard work with you. You're doing great. And that's, that's, that shouldn't be that way. The, when, when Anas got out of the car, and I'm telling you, this guy had a voice like fucking Moses, man, and echoed through a canyon. We should all work together to move the rock and clear the thing. And every car door opened up and everybody jumped out. I will help. And I was like, holy shit, man. You don't see that crap. I will help. I will risk my life because we must get the cars across. Oh, and everybody accepted the fact. Oh, yeah, it was crazy. But it was so nobody needed to be coached. Nobody needed to be paid. Nobody was nobody was filming themselves influencing while they were doing it. <laughs> right? They just straight up did the damn thing. And, and a bunch of them said, we will watch for the rocks coming down and warn you. And you guys move the rocks. And everyone said, okay. And nobody fought over who was doing the job. If, and if you wanted to switch, you could. So as soon as someone was sweaty and tired, they changed. It was just an acceptance of a struggle that they all accepted, right? And they just said, because nobody's going to fix it. We're going to have to fix it ourselves. Mm. And be because of it, it created a different kind of unity that I haven't seen except in really micro communities. And I would say like, you know, your own little dope grower crew, all of yeah. you always could depend on each other because you needed trimmers, you need it from the crew, you need, you need clones, you need to move units, you need to borrow money. You can only go into your circle because anything outside the circle is risk. Yeah. And so you learn to like, Every time your friends needed you and you'd bitch too, you'd be like, fuck, next time I come over to help you, you better have a fucking shovel. And <laughs> because your, your friends would ask you to do labor and shit. But my buddy asked me to come over and help him with, you know, do a barbecue. And he hands me a fucking wooden board to dig the hole to put a pig in. We have to dig a hole big enough to bury a fucking body. And he gives me a wooden board and I'm cracking up and I'm like, bro, I love you. We're going to go get fucking shovels and shit. But next time you get a hold of me to do this, man, make sure you bring a fucking shovel. Or at least let me know to bring mine. Because I'm not using a fucking board. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's going to take like eight yeah. fucking hours to dig a goddamn trench. I mean, we're talking about yeah. fucking ball, and he's gives me a fence, fuck a fence board. He was like, I'll, I'll do, I'll help you do this this time, but no, damn I'm it, next time. Ah, uh, no, yes. I, <laughs> I love you, ass, but that's why we're friends. It's like, I'm going I'm to still help you, but I'm going to go back to the house and come back with tools. That's a friend. Right. Those are your friends. Those are your friends that are like, listen, you're a fucking nightmare, but you never won't help me. So I'm always down. And you just know that you have to support each other regardless. And it's just a way more effective system. And then there's times where people become such a pain in the ass. You just got like, whoa. And then you know that when you're a pain in the ass, you got to go, whoa. Nah. But for the most part, you know, 90 percent of the time, man, you got a really effective system. And it was just awesome to see it in existence there. Cause it just made me feel really good about the relationships I have with my own friends. Yeah. Man, it, that's... It, it let me realize that we, we found that common link that shared struggle and shared victory is really the key to life. No, oh, absolutely. And that, and that, mm -hmm. and that's very much what I'm like hoping that we can, we can see with like looking at all of these different like cannabis cultures that like uh, that, that you can go like like uh, across the world and see that there are that there are people that that still have this strong sense of community that are show they're showing us like you know mm -hmm. uh, it's it's like a, when when you're trying to like uh, prove a hypothesis on something not only do you need to like run an experiment and test it but you also need to like reproduce that experiment in a, in other in other environments to, in yeah. order to, to see if the results still hold true and 
Totally. We're looking at how Pakistan is is like doing that and, and how it's so reflective of like what you're seeing with your crew at home in Humboldt. And honestly, I see with a lot of like my, my crew here in like the Roanoke Valley area, a lot of the growers, a lot of the cultivators here, they're like, yeah, we support each other. We got to you know, work with each other and, and do that. Um, that, that's like really, really awesome. And uh, but you can I, do it. At, you can do it, brother. You you got a good team around you. Your your podcast team is I know all of you. And and Kelly's quiet, and so she's the most quiet one on the conversation. But like, if she's sharp as fuck too. So what you have is you have a, a good team, and your desire is to expose like the quality of life. And so it's your attitude that'll let it happen because you're allowing the platform to be an open platform, and your agenda is to like let's tap into what's going on and let's bring forth some really little minute details so that we can all kind of learn and appreciate the world around us that we don't get to see because it's so filtered. And so with, without question, you're going to continue, man. I'm just the guest on the show today, but there should be many good guests that you three oh. bring in that, oh, yeah, that allow that... you really to, to, to do what you want, which is highlight and bring forth a, a topic. And I think that's awesome. That's why I'm supporting you right now. No, yeah, absolutely. You know what I mean? Because I, I, very... know, I know three of you. I know, I know who you are. So I really don't care what you do. And I know it's going to be cool because I know you. Yeah. And I think that's the main point is that, that and that's what you're going to bring forward when you move forward is you're going to bring forward the three of you, which is three good people. And that's going to allow anybody you deal with to be able to feel comfortable enough to talk. And it's going to let you get the conversation you want, which is at the end of the day, from, I've done a lot of fucking reviewing people. What you want is you want the person to be able to have the freedom to just run wild so yeah. that what it does, it lets it lets the, it just come out. And the only way that happens is if the group of people that are having the um, the back and forth with, that's their desire. You're you're here to allow your your speaker to be able to throw as much as they want out, and then all you're doing is is steering questions that you want answered specifically or picking them from the net. But it's it's a it's creating a really good platform. And that's the critical part of it is that when you want people to be able to speak freely, they have to feel safe, comfortable on the show. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, so yeah. salute. Yeah. Thank so you. I thank you. Yeah. Ho hopefully we're able to accomplish that um, with, with, our, with our podcast for here with you. Um, you know, thank you so much for, for, for coming on and, and, and like sharing your, your experience um, like with Pakistan, with like, just like the hash culture there um, I mean, really just like, I mean, uh, opening our eyes and shedding light on a very misunderstood and, and very like little known culture, especially when it's responsible for so much of the prosperity that we have here in cannabis in the United States. Um, my pleasure, and, my pleasure. Yeah. And, and I, and I don't think that I'm in any way like a Pakistani expert, man. I'm not, I just. I got saturated in it. Like, I mean, they, 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 they basically stewed us in the kettle. And so, <laughs> you, you know, you come home and it's coming out of your ears, but we were really hungry for it. And yeah. the people that brought us there were, were starving to share it. And so it, it really put a paint on you that you just, you don't want to wash it off. It's, you know, it's kind of like when they, when you, when you touch royalty, they don't want to wash their hands. This hand is, hasn't been washed since you touched royalty. <laughs> you didn't yeah. want to, you didn't want to let Pakistan wash off of you when you got home. You wanted to make sure that you you kept that 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 memory alive and and then allow people to be able to benefit from it so that at the end of the day, what you're realizing is that our culture is global. We're 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 in a silo here in Humboldt. Humboldt growers are getting their asses whipped. Well, fucking growers all over America are getting their asses whipped. Last time I checked, growers all over the world are getting their asses whipped. How many of us are there in total? And why are we always getting our asses whipped if there's this many of us? Yeah, right. So at some point, the question has to be posed. And perhaps then you'll start to create the unity we need to be able to have these inter intercontinental relationships that really reflect the reality that we're not siloed, that we're not yeah. in your little pocket, man. You're global. And we can be global. And it doesn't have to be the products global. It's the relationships are global. Yeah. The relationships are the thing. That's the currency they can't fuck with. That's the one they want to fuck with most. That's why you have this incredibly divisive language and, and portrayal of so much. Every country's got its issue. I'm not saying anybody's perfect because they're not. But at the end of the day, most people in most countries are seeking a better life. 
They want to be able to have time with their kids. They want to be able to enjoy time with their friends. They're not trying to burn the world down around them. And why can't that be our life? No, right? Like, exactly. Why Why can't that be? Why Why can't that be? Um, it can, hey. man. And it, it's a big shout out to the people like the Zomia Collective and, and the people that took Kev, the, the land lace land race brothers and all the people involved yeah, this is pakistan yeah yeah no because i know i know zomia i'm gonna i'm gonna wrap with them guys this week I, amazing I people man yeah, yeah and i and and it's all the other land race teams there's a whole group of them and someone's yeah. like well you know you help that guy how are you gonna help this guy and i said because i could fucking be friends with two people at once i'm like <laughs> i don't think like it's this complicated <laughs> i'm not involved with anybody what i'm trying to do is be of service because what, what I know is that together we'll have a future. We'll have a future. We'll be able to mm -hmm. do cool shit and, and be able to do some really interesting things, both genetically, culturally, and, and who knows what the future holds because of it. And, like, that's an incredible thing. Like, that's a currency all to itself. Just go see so it. Go build it. Go do yeah, it. Go experience yeah. it. That's how you make it happen. Just go live it. Shovel. And you'll Just bring a shovel. Do it. Yeah. <laughs> bring your shovel, yeah. baby. And then bring you some go candy work. for the kids and you'll have best friends and then pet the dogs on the trails, man. And then you'll just be taken care of. So go live yeah, it. Yeah. It's fucking beautiful. It's yeah, amazing. We got it. We got it. So, so check it out, man. It's I think we got three on this thing. I'm gonna I got I am gonna make my split on the on the cast, baby. This has been a really good time. So thank you so much for uh thank you, dealing Kevin. with the the losing my internet for a minute. You kept me on. And I, I don't know um, where it went, man. I lost the whole internet period where the whole service dropped out. And then I, I kept playing around and I left some messages for Anna saying, hey, I didn't drop you, brother. When you get these yeah. messages, you'll realize that um, there's a series of them in sequence saying no service. <laughs> so yeah, so thanks, yeah. for, thanks for keeping me online. And I oh, appreciate yeah. it. And um, anything I can do for you guys in, in what you're doing, just let me know because I, I think you have a, a, a really nice format. And I think that your desire is as genuine as it gets. Like I said, I, I know you from life. Yeah. So absolutely. this isn't we're not we're not strangers that are talking here today. We're friends in real life. Yeah. And and what what I know is that having really good people that are desiring good things, it's pretty powerful. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank so you. hopefully yeah, hopefully in um in, like in the future we can maybe have you on to talk about um this this Columbia expedition at some point. Oh hell yeah. Um, no, no, I've case. done some that's... crazy shit, man. I've been all <laughs> over the fucking place. Oh. So and and in the future too, if you do stuff and you you want to do round robins or you want to bring someone on, you want like you can always hit me up, man. Like I'm, I'm pretty good about that shit. If I get the time, I'll fuck with you. If I'm not, I'll just tell you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, I'm just I'll straight 100. up tell you. I do not have the time or the bandwidth for it right now. But otherwise, it it's even if it's ten minutes. Sometimes it's like, yo, can you just jump off for ten minutes to say what's up? Because there's someone on that you have you have a guest that says, man, I wish wish I could talk to this dude. So I have it happen all the time. So yeah. I just jump on to people's cast and I talk for fucking five minutes because really it's, it's an introduction. And what it, what it is, is it's just showing that we, we have a unity in our culture that we're willing to bend for each other's will. That it's, it, that it's okay. You, you can have five minutes of my time. Like that's, it's all right. I'm not that fucking special. It's, yeah, it's, it's very it's, special it's, to us for sure. <laughs> but it's special to me to be asked. Yeah, right. Yeah. So like it, it it's, it's, it's reciprocity. Reciprocity yeah. is the truth. It's the basis of all relationships. It's the give yeah. and take. And it, it's what lets you have, it lets you transcend levels. When you're cool, you can touch fucking greatness because your desire is what they see. And when, when people understand that, it lets you move in a way that few can. Every yeah. door opens up when they realize what your intent is. Your intent's not to fucking hurt anybody or fuck anyone over. That shit really resonates at the end of the day. And as an older yeah. guy, I realize it more than ever. And so I think that that's what the beauty of what you guys have is that the three of you are all really good people. And it, it lets there be a, a, a really good synergy. So thank yeah. you so much. And um, I'll, I'll talk to you soon. Yeah, man. Right. Talk to you soon. Have a great night. Awesome. Okay. Appreciate you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, hey Kelly, did you have any um, uh, final thoughts that you wanted to uh, uh, li li leave us with before before we do our, our wrap up? Oh man, uh, I don't know. There's just a lot that we talked about. So, uh, oh my God, honestly, I'm super hungry. But um, <laughs> <laughs> <God>. <laughs> yeah, but, yeah, uh, yeah, um, yeah. It's just fascinating. Just like think about talking about the culture and just the 
hash and like even you having a little demo of like the tobacco and the hash kind of show us what that ideally where Pakistani people would smoke. So yeah. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. Oh yes, that definitely, definitely very insightful. I, I appreciate you um, uh, handling the moderation for our questions, even with mm -hmm. all of all of the issues, including yeah. including our ghost comment section, which turned out to be the bulk of our comment section. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and, and Ryan, I definitely, I appreciate you bringing your insights, um, and your really thought provoking questions, um, for Kevin, like seeing the, the, the dichotomy between these two cultures, um, allows us for a truly stereoscopic viewpoint uh, of like what we have going on here in the United States. Um, so it's like, definitely thank you for that. Um, Pleasure, man. thank you for having me. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, so, and, and uh, not to worry, folks. That definitely will be uh, what we'll be having these guys on more in the future um, as they are as they are able and and available. Um, I, like uh, so so no no need to worry on that part. You won't have to deal with uh, my mug. Although mostly you'll be dealing with my mug. <laughs> Um, so like definitely make sure to drop a like, um, you know, subscribe if you haven't already, um, put in the comments, like what was your favorite part in there? Was there anything that like, uh, that you like to, to have been covered a little more in depth? Um, is, uh, like, has this inspired you to take a trip to Pakistan? Cause, um, Kevin didn't mention it in the stream. Um, but like, uh, if, if you, like I said, go check out the future cannabis project, he mentions in there that the cheapest part of traveling to Pakistan is the plane ticket um i mean i'm sorry the most expensive that, that's the, the most, most expensive, expensive part i <laughs> yeah. look at me what am i doing i haven't I, you good. haven't seen me toke like um <laughs> it's the most expensive part of the entire trip is the plane ticket so like as we start to start to drift away from this whole idea of vilifying like other other cultures because it's, it's a, essentially creating a xenophobia where where people americans are like afraid to leave the country because they think that you know there's going to be a red dot on our chest or back as soon as we get off the plane when in actuality most of these people like are just happy to see you like are just are just like ready to like share their culture like and also show that they're not the monsters they're being portrayed at like all yeah. over like the media and whatnot they love travelers they just were stoked to say you know like hey this is our thing and we're not you don't have to pay attention to that stuff because that's that's the extreme and, and everybody has an extreme no matter where you're from and damn you can, right yeah. And so they were just there. And like, it's, it's for me, from my personal expect perspective, just like as soon as they knew we'd have a conversation, we'd start talking. They want to know where you're from. They know that you're not from there. Right. Especially being a white guy. So I show up and I'm like, hey, I'm from America. And they're stoked. They're stoked to hear that you're from America and you came all the way here. And, and again, from my perspective, that was the first time I ever traveled international. I decided to go to India and they were just ecstatic they loved it they, i mean fuck, we got offered free food and free tea and you know hey come hang out come smoke with us whatever it was just they just wanted to have a conversation with somebody from america or from italy or from spain or from wherever you were from it was pretty really cool to see it was cool yeah very very awesome all right so um guys like i said um we appreciate you taking the time um to watch this live stream um, I will be going live again tomorrow because um, as like you saw that I made this cigarette, but I haven't smoked it yet. And that's because I, I don't smoke tobacco in the house. Um, so I will be doing my live stream outside um, tomorrow so that we can smoke this hash cigarette um, and, and, you know, enjoy that a little bit and maybe like talk about that stuff a little bit more. So definitely be on the lookout for that. Um, I don't know what time we'll be streaming tomorrow, but y'all know how I do. Um, but yes, this has been, um, Enki's Canicult. Um, I'm Alchemist Ganjier you now with my, with my co-host here. Um, oh, oh oops, that's not switching, right? Ryan, you know, and Kelly, <laughs> um, make sure that you guys are taking time for yourself. Make sure that you are showing love for yourself and peace. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>